Welcome to the Living Artist Podcast. I'm your host, Preston M. Smith. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Living Artist Podcast. I'm Preston M. Smith at PMS Artwork Everywhere on Internet Land and Socials. I want to thank you for landing on this podcast. Whether you're a professional artist, just getting started in the art world, a collector of art, or just consider yourself a creative person, this podcast has something for you. I like to think of it as a fun way to rant and talk to other creative people about living the life of an artist, surviving and getting ahead in the art world, and enjoying your life. But most importantly, not waiting until you're dead to make it happen. All right, let's get started. All right, we are here with Carrie Maurice, aka Carrie Maurice Counts, aka I don't know how you say this, Camo, Camo. How do you say Camo, it? Camo? Camo. Wow, there's a lot of names that I've had over the years. <laughs> like like say like Samo, right? That, exactly. That's where it's going. Nice. I love it. And then we are also here with Mike Collins. Everybody who listens to the podcast already knows Mike from Shockbox. Uh, how you doing, Mike? Good. And I'm also known as Mike. You are known <laughs> as Mike. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's funny, man. Well, do you want to be, we can give you a, a nickname if you want. Myco? Right. Myco and Camo? And yeah, we'll PMS. Just go with Mike. Yes. Let's just keep it with Mike. All right, we'll go with Mike. <laughs> Well, it's good to have you both here. We got uh, Carrie is on the East Coast in uh, New York or, or New Jersey, right? Are you in Trenton? I am. I am in Princeton. Oh, we call it, we call it the Beast Coast. <laughs> ah, nice. I love it. Awesome. Well, cool. I'm really excited to talk to you both. Um, I've talked to Mike before on the podcast, but um, Carrie's been part of some of the shows at Shockbox. Uh, we're probably going to start here because you got two. Awesome shows coming up with Shockbox. Uh, one is a solo show, and the other is with Intergalactic Open 2, uh, where he, he got a piece admitted into that as well. So I'm going to kind of open it up to you guys first, just to just to talk about the shows. Carrie, if you want to start, Mike, if you want to start, what do we got coming down the pipeline with Shockbox and Carrie? Open it, Mike. What? I'll open up. So yeah, Carrie, Carrie showed up. Well, it must have been about two summers ago at this point, you know, here at Shockbox in Hermosa Beach, we have the, I guess we'll call it an honor, right, of being able to work with Patty Astor. Oh, yeah. Uh, fun gallery fame from the 80s. And, um, you know, I'd met her and she'd become a friend of, of mine and of the gallery when we had this idea to kick off a show that celebrated her history in the art world. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, she puts everything on blast. She's got more Facebook followers than all of us combined. <laughs> and uh, when we started kicking out the art calls, I think that's when you showed up, Carrie. And that yes. show, it was really cool. Uh, you know, we wanted to celebrate Patty. And in the process of doing that, started getting emails and, and phone calls and, and other forms of contact from artists in the New York and New Jersey area that had known Patty, you know, back in the day. And uh, I feel like with Patty's help, with some of those artists' help, you know, some history from people like you, Carrie, we were able to pull off a show that was uh, felt really authentic, really legitimate. I know Patty was proud. And I think, and this is maybe where I'll pass you the mic, Carrie, I think you were proud. I think you noticed this little gallery out in Hermosa Beach that, that, that uh, did it right. And Oh, I've, I, I've got goosebumps. Give me that opening. Um, Fantastic, Mike. Yes, I did discover Shockbox through Patty Astor. And, um, you know, I did try to bring some of this again, Beast Coast, New York flavor from the 80s, because I was one of those artists who um, happened to be on the scene <clears throat> a few yeah. years younger than those guys and all. But, you know, I got, you know, the smoke coming from south to where I live from the Bronx, New York, and I headed to New York as a teenager. So, you know, I got there uh, a little bit late for Fun Gallery, only maybe a year or two. I probably went over to Soho when everything else kind of moved over there. But yeah, Patty introduced me to you guys over there on the West Coast of Chopbox. And, um, you know, it's been an amazing ride. 
just in this past year, I would say, with you guys and being in these two shows. I, I'm ecstatic. I mean, you know, if you could see me, I'm sweating at the lip right now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know what? You know what's funny, Carrie. You you might not know this about Hermosa Beach, but um, around the time that everything was jumping off in New York in the art scene and and uh, you know, like new wave was coming about and all that stuff and punk rock, um, Hermosa Beach is really uh, the West Coast home of a lot of punk rock. It's where it was born, and there's still this vibe in our community of, you know, we always like to keep it real and throw it back to the late seventies and early eighties, you know, like the locals are like, that's, that's the last time Hermosa was cool. And um, <laughs> I, I, I feel like we have enough of a, a sense of our history here, you know, in the little area where the gallery is, I think Preston could even speak to it, that there's still this level of like, you know, we got to sniff you out and make sure that you're, you know, that you can kind of get in and play with the, play with the big boys down here. We're trying to keep it real. And, uh, That's you know, so the true. fun gallery stuff and even, even what you're up to Carrie. And uh, yeah, go ahead, Preston. You said it's true. No, I was saying that's so true. And what I love about talking to both of you, and I think you probably both will agree. Well, for me personally, I grew up, I was in love with the 1980s, New York and Basquiat, Keith Haring. We're going to get into that, Carrie. But um, yeah, I just, I love the fact that Shockbox has that similar kind of aesthetic. It almost feels like we're continuing something that left off in the 80s. And I always wanted to be part of something like that, a scene like that, and almost like a movement in the art world. And that's why I'm so excited about Shockbox. And having you come in, Gary, kind of bridges I that. Would have, yeah. I would agree. Let, let me just, you know, jump in on that. Yeah, Jesse, for sure. Because you guys, you know, when you were explaining it to me, you know, how, you know, you had this... Um, Definite uh, 80s kind of flavor feel and the punk definitely was what was resonating from 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 your description of your gallery. And then you yeah. mentioned like a few other galleries that are out there that are doing the pops real stuff and all that. It's a few years later, you know, maybe a decade later. However, I picked up on that. And then when you showed me uh, through video, the neighborhood and all of that, when I got in the first show, and showed me the tour of the gallery and how that's set up. I mean, man, you guys got this little East Village scene on a beach. Yeah, yeah. four blocks it's, off. It's really <laughs> trippy. <laughs> you know, but that, that feeling is there, but the ocean is right there too. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm I'm in for the ride because of the love of the location. And now you've given me more history. I was a skater back in the day oh, in nice. the 70s. So I never made it to California and hit Venice because that was always the dream to get Venice Beach and skate Venice. But um, anyway, this is close enough. <laughs> oh, is, I'm loving it, guys. Oh, that's awesome. Well, so let's talk a little bit about the shows. Uh, um, I guess we'll start. I mean, let's start with your, show, your solo show because that's got to be exciting. And what are you going to be showcasing if it's not too much of a secret? I'll let <laughs> Carrie start with that. And Mike, you can jump in if you want. No secret at all. Um because I'm sitting on such an inventory of works. Again, you know, I'm one of these early 80s artists that kind of didn't get picked up by anybody. I mean, I did show, but, you know, I'm sitting on 400 plus. Yeah, so you're still what, here. I have to, what I have to do is decide on what I'm going to show, whether it's going to be something from the past or something from the future. So right. my decision this time was to get a full body of works out, enough to fill a gallery <clears throat> with a certain particular theme or subject. In this particular case, it's pretty personal, but yet I've got enough hints and, and clues in there to tie you into a lot of art history, as simple as the images are. So it's going to be exciting for me to even see the show up because I've never, ever seen this much work of my own up. I've never had a solo exhibition, you know, and I'm 30 some odd years deep into this. So it's, it's really uh, beyond my excitement level of being in a show of my own created by myself. I even made a model of the building so I could know what, awesome. what, what to do and what to show. So, you know, I, I'm looking forward to this person. Oh, I love it. And is it basically kind of a cohesive structure? Like are all the pieces in a similar style or series? Or are you kind of doing more of a retrospective type thing? No, it's one particular series. I think, again, I knocked out 31, which pretty much was a record for me to stick with one particular thing. So um, normally after five or six or 10, you know, you're like, okay, I'm tired of doing that. I need <laughs> yeah. to move on. But I had to work through this, some, some personal issues through, believe it or not, an ice cream cone is my reference. Yes. I, I had to just do enough ice cream until I'm just 
full, I guess. <laughs> I love it. I've seen a couple of your ice cream cone pieces in my research and I dig them. There's a little bit of a connection with uh, neuropathy in those, if I'm not mistaken, right? You are absolutely right. Um, the neurological aspect of the cone and gravity and all of these issues that we have to deal with that are unseen, mm -hmm. I unfortunately have to experience as a disabled person because I deal with neuropathy due to a lot of problems I have. I fell down a lot, we'll say, without going into detail. But, yeah. but but the ice cream itself, you know, it being something that, you know, if you put it in the sun, guess what happens? You know, there's a very limited time in which you can enjoy it. And there's a very limited time in which, you know, it can actually be what it is. Right. So that's a summary of pretty much what I'm dealing with as a human being. Well, I love that. I'm going to kick it over to Mike I in a second. That. Yeah, but it's, that's it, powerful, Carrie. It is. And it's one of those things where I think having that backstory is really important too for people. Like that's why I wanted to get this out before the show, because the more of a connection they feel with the pieces, the more they can hear your story and how it connects with this series. I think the more important it becomes, you know? And yeah, Mike, if you want to jump in, uh, go ahead. Yeah, that's a great segue, Preston. I, I like that, that, you know, to get personal about what Carrie's doing gets into sort of how the show came about and even, even why we would do it. Right. Because here's an artist that's in New Jersey. And uh, one of the first questions that I ask myself and even the artist, if we're going to do a solo show is how are we going to get people to come to the gallery? Right. Like, are your fans right. going to show up or is this going to be banging? And um, obviously with a pandemic, with quarantine, with Carrie being on the other side of the country, we're going to have a different kind of opening. And what I really like about that concept is it's been working for us for a year now with, with quarantine and yeah, hosting definitely. our openings on Zoom, some of that stuff, your podcast, uh, some of the articles that the local papers might write. Like we've got this uh, system now that's really got uh, some great followers participating, some great artists participating, the media participating at a level. And so we can draw a crowd. Yeah, definitely. With, with Carrie's show, um, you know, you really fit with with our program artists, Carrie, in that you're, you know, you have a you have a longer history than any of us in the art world, but you're experimental and you're willing to take risks. And this show is is a huge risk. You know, I, I'll go back to, you know, we've had you in more than just two group shows, but when you started asking about the gallery and asked me for the dimensions of the gallery. I thought you were just curious about Shockbox on a deeper level. <laughs> and, the, and the next thing I know, he's sending me, you know, mock-ups of the gallery and this is how my solo show is going to be. And <laughs> like, oh, I guess Carrie's having a solo show. Like, let's do this. Um, and, and so I'm really excited uh, for this for a couple of reasons. One, I feel honored to be sitting in a position to, to make this happen for you, Carrie, that, it's it's a shame that your work hasn't been exposed, you know, yeah, through yeah. all the channels um, and through all the means that, that I think that an artist of your caliber deserves. And then secondly, agreed. the challenge of trying to throw down, you know, a solo show from across the country is exciting to me. And it really helps our gallery because since we started, you know, what's it been almost four years now, Preston, our yeah, initial, our initial mission was to, to have a gallery in Hermosa Beach that attracted the attention of the art world so far beyond Hermosa Beach. Because what we're always guilty about in the South Bay or in Hermosa, and maybe it's even like a West Coast thing, we try to take care of our own community so much that our art shows become boring. They become, uh, what's the word, provincial. Mm -hmm. You keep showing the same 10 people over and over again. Locals and only, bro that's cool but it's also really boring and what's happened with us is getting all these other artists involved and then getting the attention of them and their followers and the art world has made us all so much better and oh yeah it, you know it feels like a it feels like some kind of a badge to be able to be getting ready to say that we're going to do this solo show from a from an east coast from a new jersey artist that was around you know i completely I feel, agree yeah, I agree as well. I mean, for for this opportunity, for this door, and I'll say kick in the door, wave in the four four, 
because that's the way I feel. <laughs> because there was no way around here or over here was anyone going to open any door for me to do anything. That's really the sad truth about the Beast Coast is because there's so much competition and we're so condensed that if you don't have facility such as galleries and, or even virtual spaces for that matter now, how, how are you going to show your work? So, you know, my struggle for the past, I don't know, umpteen years, we'll say, decades, is that, you know, trying to get that work seen and trying to get the exposure and get the support system going was like an impossibility because you have like, a, it's like Crab City. You know, you have all these crabs in a barrel yep. <laughs> fighting for one opportunity or one particular gallery or one nonprofit space might be having the whole gambit of the art scene and everyone's competing to deal with this one institution who can't possibly handle, you know, a couple thousand artists. So, yeah, that's so true. You, know, you have to start leaving and branching out. And my thing was, again, I, I had to get out of there, you know, starting high school. I already knew what I wanted to do. So, you know, the thing for me was to get the work to be seen. And how was I going to do that? You know, was, was the biggest challenge of my life was I have the skills. I mean, I was kind of born with it, you know, and um, I only had a problem with real life. Creativity is like, <laughs> since kind of just waking up and, you know, it's normal for me as, as a child. So, again, I had a problem with real life and really kind of monetize my life and make it important. And I'm glad this opportunity now is here. Well, I think that's important what you're saying, Carrie, because that speaks to a lot of artists. I think a lot of artists have a problem with life and relating to life and the, the business of the art world. And everybody's vying for attention. And it's so hard to get that attention. So what I love about your story is you talk about all these guys who you used to know. Well, you're still here. You outlasted yes. these people. And now you're getting some, you know, some real shots here to show your work. And I think that's amazing. Yeah. You know, it, is, it is. Go ahead, Mike. I, um, you know, Kerry, you're, you're, at a, you're at an age where the digital world, like you had to jump onto it. Like that train was already moving. And I feel like younger artists, they have they have a different relationship with Instagram and social media. And there's a way that they can get themselves kind of up and seen in the art world mm -hmm. that that wasn't around when you were a kid. And I, I just want to add, you know, it was only two or three years ago that I went to New York City for the first time in my life. What? And, yeah. And walking around uh, Manhattan. I, I was just hit with this reality that that city, first of all, the footprint of, of New York and New Jersey is really small, you know, compared yes. to Los Angeles, but oh, the yeah. amount of energy, you know, just everything that's packed into there is so awesome and so powerful. But, but what I kept thinking about uh, was my, at least my limited understanding of the beginning of like hip hop and graffiti and the art scene and all that, and how important the subway system played in that. Like that oh, was yeah. the original Instagram. You know, if you're in New Jersey, oh, yeah. you wanted your friends in in Brooklyn to see your work, you just throw it on a train, right? If yeah, you could get it on I mean, in that case, absolutely, Mike. I agree. Yeah, yeah. and and it, what it made me realize was just that that city. There's so much opportunity in that city, but that city also is so big that it just doesn't give a shit who you are. It doesn't, oh, and, it, it's, and it demands that you get up. It demands that you write your name higher than the guy before you. It just like the hip hop artist, you know, when it demands that you flex on yep. people because yep. that's the only way that you're going to get out. And I, I mean, I'd heard all that stuff and seen all that stuff, but until I walked around that city and realized just how anonymous you are, uh, yeah, it makes it the art scene so different, you know. Um, so I, I it, feel you in, in that, like, there's this near impossibility of getting seen. It yeah. can be, it can be so daunting of a task. Is that <clears throat> this is what most artists probably, and this is a lot of good advice for young people, is that you've got to give something up. I mean, that's just the way it is. Like, if you say you want something, and if it's New York City, for instance, and you felt that energy, if you want something and you're that energy's going on, just think how much you have to ramp it up if you're coming from, okay, Jersey, it might be a little easier. But further out, as you in, enter the circle or out of the circle, you see how you have to, like, pick up your own pace and almost amplify it. You know, more than you can even imagine, because even the little bit that you think of, once you get there, you go, oh, shit, 
uh, I got, <laughs> this is not enough. You yeah. Know? So right. that's when the sacrifices come in. Um, whereas you're going to have to say, make a break. <clears throat> whereas you're going to end up sleeping on the streets or whatever you have to do uh, to culture your crew, your, 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 your support system. You've got to find that. And imagine again in New York city, trying to find that. And there's different boroughs, different sections, different hoods, different. I mean, each block is a different scene. You know what I mean? So that's why getting up in your little block, you have to go higher than the next person. And it just on and on and on because of the competitive aspect of it. But some, at some point, you have to really find it quick because it'll wear you out. And as we see in a lot of artists, you know, who are not here today, mm -hmm. um, their, their choices they made were for a right and wrong reason, I would say. I mean, we can get into this later. We could talk about specific artists, but I'm just mm -hmm. saying that 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 sacrifice is something most people don't even think about. And they get hit blindsided and they might end up, you know, on the street or they lose everything. Um, you have to have that street sense is where I'm trying to boil this down to is that that awareness that you're in this, this beast coast and you've got to rise above the rest. Yes. Well, let me jump in here too. I, I love all that. And I love, Mike, what you were saying about the subway almost being a delivery system for some of the art. I almost see New York back in that period as like a microcosm of what's going on right now. What's that, Mike Preston? <laughs> Mike, you got to take you, this jinx off me, man. <laughs> I don't know. But you almost see New York in a particular something or other. That's oh, what cut out. Yeah, I almost see New York in that era as like a microcosm of what's going on right now with social media. It's not oh, the yeah. stakes aren't as high, but as far as getting yourself out there and fighting with a huge pool of other artists, like it's easy to do, but it's not easy to rise above everybody else and, and get your artwork seen by the right channels. You can do some stuff here and there and you can call yourself an artist, but getting to the top is very difficult. Yeah, and a top, and again, you have to be aware of what your top is because, you know, everybody gets all screwed up with this um, idea of success. Yes. you know, And then you get up in age like me, you know what I mean? And you have these dreams in the beginning. Oh, yeah, I'm going to blow up and I'm going to have a mansion and a yacht, you know, within five years. <clears throat> and that doesn't happen. Now you're depressed and you're popping pills and all that stuff. You know, so, again, you, you, your idea of success should be what success means to you, like it personally. Not not pleasing other people or anything or like trying to get a woman and all that. I'm talking about what it really means personally for you, because I had to really change gears in my mindset, you know, when I got injured and thought about what my limitations were. And I said, you know, you are successful now. So whatever happens after this is a piece of cake. Now you can get a chance to eat it. You see what I mean? I like that. Do you, do, so you do you feel that you found that, Carrie? Do you feel like you're successful? Yeah, 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 yeah. It hit. I would say when 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 the pandemic struck this world, somehow for me, it pretty much blew the doors wide, blew the world open for me because it slowed everybody down to my level of operation. Seems like yeah. That now I can capitalize on it because I've been dormant for waiting so long for people to slow down so I could like get in there and go look what I got. You know, yeah, like it's, yeah, it's it's crazy. Again, you guys, no one knows I have an inventory. No one knows I work, you know, just 24, 7, 365. I think, you know, my last piece is going to be the last thing I do and I'm going to drop dead. You know, it's just like, <laughs> so I've worked under those premises that, you know, this might be your last series. Now I probably got 50 of them or something. I don't know. But that keeps you fresh too, right? But, but yeah, being scared keeps you pretty, pretty fresh. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, Carrie, you mentioned... Now we're all scared, right? So yeah. Yeah. join the club. You mentioned the pandemic. And um, I'll tell you, the with even with the gallery, I've noticed, you know, we're, we're a really small do-it-yourself artist-run gallery and we're flexible. And, and we were able to roll with that, you know, with the opening wave and then every wave that came after that. And it's been, it's been, a, it's been absolutely beneficial to our gallery, to, to the way that Preston has created these international art calls on cafe, the way that we were reaching out to artists all over the country and even all over the world, coinciding with being forced onto Zoom has allowed us to to reach into places I don't think that we ever would have been able to reach into 
um, including getting noticed in a bigger way by Artsy and some of the other, you know, publications and decision makers in the art world whose attention we could not have gotten without the slowdown. Because I think a lot of the big galleries, they have the the bankroll to just be like, you know what, we're going to lock the doors and we'll be back when we can go back to in-person stuff. Yeah. And, and the little guys like us, you know, it goes back to like you, you talking about success, Carrie, for, for the gallery, you know, if, if the gallery just breaks even or comes close to breaking even most of the time, I feel like we're being really successful because this is a passion project. Mm -hmm. Um, Anything else is just sprinkles on that ice cream cone to keep it Mm -hmm, real mm -hmm. with your show, you know? Yeah, Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'll look back at this time and be really grateful. Um, and, but also, Mike, you didn't get complacent, though. You know, there's a lot of people, I think, who just were like, oh, this is what's been working for us, and they're not going to adapt. And you adapted. Right. We stepped yeah. it up. And if you get complacent for one second, going back to what Carrie's saying, you're gone. You're done. Honestly, in the art world, there's so many people trying to get that attention. Yeah. I, I find well, that. I would, I would, Go ahead, Carrie. I was just going to jump in and add to what Preston said about what you guys have done to actually make that transition. And I noticed that right away is when you went virtual and did the 3D tour of the gallery way ahead of some of the big boys over here. That's when I knew you guys were really ahead of your game. And I said, I'm going to ride this tide as long as I can because they're very innovative and I see a future. Yeah. Nice. You're, you're welcome to be a part of it. I, I, you, you said you used to skate back in the day and I'll tell you that, for me, that was that was the first time you know, because I I started skating kind of was there in the when I was a little kid like in the transition right from little skinny boards like you were riding to 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 vert boards and and bigger stuff and some of the some of the older kids in the neighborhood had a skateboard ramp and when my friends and I would want to go skate they would be like well you know you can skate on Saturdays from one to two but that's it because you guys are kids and they kind of <laughs> you know they 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 were they were you know they were given us a hard time welcoming us into the tribe but we just went and built our own ramp and there you go, there you go. see yeah yep. and made and made our own scene and you know we still hung out with those guys too but it's like if 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 you're not going to um let us play on your on your on your playground we're going to make our own and we're going to be inclusive and that's been that's been what we've done with shockbox all along is like it, the people that show up and want to participate, we're going to give them as much space as they want to play with us because because together we're all making it better. Even those three D scans, man. A friend of mine that does that for a living contacted me and said, "Hey, I want to do some scans for your gallery." And when he did it, I said, "How how can we monetize this for you? How can I pay you for your time?" And he said, "I just want to create with you guys." And yes. I feel like that's you know the creatives in times like a pandemic. Some people put their head in the sand, but the but the real one, that's when they get to work. Exactly. Yeah. Well, there's there's there's, there's a fire that burns, you know. Um, at least I'll say me personally. I'm not going to get into other people's what makes them tick, but there's a fire that burns inside. So when something like this happens, you know, what do they say? You fight fire with fire. So. Right. You know, even you know, even in California, you guys are out there. You know how that works. You know, with the burn back and all that kind of stuff. You really <laughs> have to fight fire with fire. Yeah, so when these situations come up, um, it's either step up or step out. Um, but as far as support with me, if it came to me, I'm giving it back. And if I can give it back 200 percent because I had gotten accepted or acknowledged, or whatever the case, someone said yes to me, you get my hundred percent loyalty. Because I've never had that, <clears throat> you know, right. over again, we're talking decades. So the only person that ever delivered that to me personally, one-on-one was Keith Haring. Mm-hmm. He's the only person in my life who I met who literally, day Wait, one. Wait, I'm sorry, who? Just kidding. Keith Haring. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted to talk to about, about you and Keith Haring. I was just kidding for the for the kids growing up. But yeah. Uh-huh. He- so anyway, yes, you kiddies out there don't know. Who, I'm sure you know who he is. This is just, it's kind of crazy. He's getting a lot of, lot of press right now. And I did That's true. based on that. And there's going to be more coming down the pike, I was told. But however, back to the fire burning and when something happens and you need support and you go find it and you get it, you're not going to let that go. I mean, right. I don't know anybody else who kind of 
kind of poops on people and, you know, takes an opportunity, jumps on their back and keeps moving on to the next. But I'm not one of those people. You know, I, I'm, I'm pretty like, you know, like a little puppy dog or a little. I went I, to I, Hollywood, Carrie. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I've been out there. I went out there and it, it struck me kind of different. You know, because yeah. <laughs> I'm a t- TV kid. So when you get there and you look at what it is, you go, well, wait a minute. I thought all the studios are going to be located in one space. Right. I had no idea. You have Burbank. You've got a call for city. Yeah. Yep. Got- so, so there's all these different places where they make TV. So I didn't have time to chase all that down when I went out there. But it, I had a very interesting experience speaking of Hollywood and um Mixed emotions there, Preston, about that. Oh, I'm sure, as as a lot of us do. It's weird, you know. I mean, everyone has this idea, right? Until you hit the reality of it. Yes. So you, you arrive and you go, okay, it's not what I thought it would be. So now you got to regroup if you didn't have Plan A, B, or C set up for yourself, and yep. you got to now start from ground zero all over again, and that like introspection finding yourself you don't have time when you're in another location to do that well and can i say it's a, it's a recalibration but also some people i think find out that they don't really want it it was a, it was some sort of dream or projection that they had yes. of what it would be and when they are actually faced with it, it's like oh this is not what i thought it was i'm not i don't want this anymore yes that's what we're facing in this global situation right now it's okay none of us wanted this but guess what we now have to adjust our entire way of living based yes. on this little this little thing that started as a germ has now infested the entire world into this social adjusting economic balance crazy you know what i mean everything's now has to tip some kind of way yeah if we all don't step to the table again guess what we're going to go back to the same old shit same old that's right same old so it's all, it's up it's up to all of us to kind of step in when we see something that we can help or do or or, or change. And our creativity is going to thing that does it all the time. All the creatives take care of you know the problems. We just don't get credit. So true, man. I I love that. I wanted to say real quick because I got so many notes and questions for you. Um, I, I just want to hit you with, if you guys don't mind uh, changing subjects real quick. Mm-mm. I don't. Go ahead. Mike, Mike, you still there? Yeah, go right ahead. You're doing it. This is great. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to hit you with a list of topics, Carrie, because you got so much, man. And why don't you just tell me when I'm done what you want to <clears> talk <throat> about? I got relationship with Keith Haring. I got Red Balloon Studio, Neuropathy, 1980s New York art scene, Trenton 365, Fun Gallery. Your current work, getting mistaken for Basquiat, custom framing, Camo. I think we already talked about that. Why don't you pick one of those? Wow. And we'll yeah. roll with it. Hmm. Well, well, some of them, three overlap. Three are really overlapping, and they kind of create a nice story. Okay. So if I had to spin the wheel of fortune, <laughs> um, let's say, let's see what's important. Sony Studios, Culver City. There you go. Um. Red Balloon Studio, that's let's that's, that's put that aside because that gets into this whole other social political thing. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about let's do the important. Let's do high school, getting out of high school, Keith Herring and the Basquiat mi- mistaken identity stuff. I like it. Okay. So uh, I guess I might as well just open up simply say um I kind of in the beginning was mentioning how things are pretty much uh, the beast coast here and opportunity is very small and you have to have a a, a very keen sense of where your window is. Yes. So, okay, what was happening to me as a high school kid, I was the the kid being teased and all that. They couldn't figure out what I was. Was I gay, straight, whatever, you know. And, you know, at 16 years old, I had already been in New York City. I mean, my family always took us there. I did the Radio City Music Hall, all the theaters and all this. I have a very uh, interesting creative family, although they're not engaged in it. But they did introduce me to culture through New York City and all of that. So anyway, 16 years old, I find myself at the Rainbow Room for my 16th birthday. It was like a kind of like a Jewish, you know how they do the big Jewish birthday parties for the Bar mitzvah the, yeah. for the guys. It's the okay. So my aunt, very glamorous woman, got her so took me to the rainbow room. 
for for my 16th birthday introduced me to culture nice. and I, never, I, right I, I remember the meal i had and everything guys it was you know long island roast duck a la orange with nice. a, with, a, with a wild rice <laughs> pilaf you know i'm just like dining in the rainbow room 16 years old you know what i mean i didn't have a jacket yeah. they gave me a jacket from the from the room to the room you know the whole it's like a movie the gentleman doesn't have a jacket give me the oversized jacket on me so I could eat. And they had the rotating uh, rotating restaurant floor. There were only two in the world at that time and Trenton had one. Unfortunately, it kind of closed down and all that. But at the time, there was two rotating dining room floors on the East Coast. So I'm at the Rainbow Room dining and eating my food and um, enjoying my meal. And my aunt says, okay, we're going out, to di- going out after this. I thought that was it for me, okay? So we stroll down the street. Next thing you know, we pull up. There's some velvet ropes, and we're standing there, and I don't know what the place is. And then we get to closer, and then I realized it's the Playboy Club. <laughs> nice. So I'm amazed thinking to myself, how would my aunt even have a membership card? I thought this was a, ma- a guy's thing. You know what I mean? You know thinks Playboy. You think it's a man's gentleman's club, right? Right. But she had a membership card. So we go in, I'm 16, I'm wondering, okay, they're going to car us, you know, I'm not going to go in there, I'm going to say he's too young, whatever, they didn't care, the grandfather laws were in effect at the time, so you had to be 18 to drink, so I'm inside this place, just, again, you got, I can't even describe this, it'll take too long, but bunnies, cigarette girls walking around, cocktails being served, um, you know, velvet Anything you can imagine, like in a Frank Sinatra movie or something yeah, like that. Exactly. It was like all it was all glamorous and everybody was all glammed up. You know, and I was just like, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Yeah, this is what I'm doing <laughs> for the rest of my life. Look for Playboy bunnies and disco music. Yeah. <laughs> it was just I had the time of my life left there. Now I'm in high school, maybe junior. Two years from graduating, and again, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very fashionable, I'm very knowledgeable, I'm cultured and art, and I'm hanging out at the Playboy Club. Can it's, I ask you a question, like, Terry? Can I interrupt really quick? Yes, sir. Go ahead. So this is, I'm assuming this is the uh, mid-70s, maybe, late 70s? Yeah, late 70s. So, About 77. So these, yeah, so there's these, you know, I've seen it just in documentaries and things, but at, is, is this the time when there were a lot of parts of, of New York and I'm assuming maybe New Jersey that were just completely neglected and falling apart? Like, was there just a huge disparity yeah. between wealth and, and uh, struggle? Yes, it was such a, a flip. Like you had, you know, extreme poverty, especially if you want to talk about the Bronx and all of that. That was pretty much burned out and burning. But yeah, OK. During Man- at Manhattan, if you're in Manhattan, they were pretty much you know, what do they call it? Recession free or whatever. Manhattan flows no matter what. Recession okay. okay. Yeah. But, you know, nothing changes. The boroughs suffer and all that stuff. Manhattan is money making Manhattan. You know, you're not going to mess with the money in Manhattan. So, yeah. you know, even in the pandemic, money's still flowing. You know, okay. don't, don't be fooled. But the thing is, you know, oh, you some know, people are making more money right now. Exactly. And the yeah. thing is, at that time, <clears throat> people wanted to escape that, that, reality okay of the the the, the blight and, and and 42nd street you know the pimps and nozzle and all that kind of stuff so you had the shelter of a club and you had the the, the guys of glamour you know what i mean to disguise this disparity going on so once you're in there you're living in the fantasy world i mean that's what discos were anyway you're in a fantasy world you're forgetting about your troubles you know and all this stuff even the songs are saying it, like forget about your troubles have a good time <laughs> just, yeah right so you know how could you not want to be a part of that yeah so you you're for at least six or seven hours you know you you don't worry about that when you're in the club you know and you go back next week so again you have your little way of escaping escapism through nightclubs right and they 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 cater you know they serve a purpose so anyway i'm 16 doing all this stuff so there was nothing after that you could teach me or wanted to educate me about other than making money and getting back to that club or, 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 you know, having a a little mansion of my own, like that was it. So my mind was made up. Um, 
at that early age. And I started leaving my home, not knowing my parents didn't know where I was, my brother, sister, I would take off because there was nothing around for me to do. I played all I could play, you know, sports. I did all that stuff. You know, I could have been the best pitcher. I could have been the best catcher. I could have been the best. Of, but, you know, all that just kind of faded away slowly because fashion and art was becoming more of my thing. Yeah. And so I had to figure a way how to get into it. And again, there was nothing in Jersey that, and I knew New York. So I just started going to New York City and hanging out. And, and then going to the clubs and, and, and reading the Village Voice was a key factor in how I got to meet <clears throat> the people that I met. Because I'm, I tried to do college from my first year. I'm sitting in the library and I'm picking up the Village Voice. So I'm not doing any studies or anything like that. I'm just picking up the Village Voice, reading about what clubs open, where to go. And I did read about the Mud Club. I had, this one girl, I had this one girl in my class, um, and she'd be kind of zonked out in my drawing class. And I'd sit there, and I'm like, what's wrong with you, Colleen? She says, oh, I was out in New York last night. And I'm like, where are you at? She's at the mug club. And I'm thinking, you know, I just read about that place. What's it like? Blah, blah, blah. You know, I want to go. But I never went. Maybe for all the good reasons, you know, now that I'm still alive. But the thing yeah. is, you know, I was headed to the mug club. I was going to go. And I didn't know about John or Keith or anything like that, you know. And you're, um, and Carrie, you're still, you're well under 21 at this point, right? Oh yeah, I'm, on, I'm, I'm just hitting at this point. I'm a little older, so I'm just getting about 20. Be 20, 20, yeah, yeah 20, about 20 yeah, there's, years there's old. All the, I've we've met and become friends with a guy named Drew Carolyn. That's a friend of Patty Astor's. He was a uh, photographer that was hanging around the Mud Club, CBGB, Fun Gallery, and all that. And in all of his pictures, there's all these, like, they just, I guess the times were such that you didn't have to really be 21 to walk into a club. Huh? Like people no, you didn't. In. You had <laughs> yeah. to have the look. It's all about the look. See, this is why the fashion came into play for me, too, because, you know, you had to have the look. So it was all about that. You know, so, you know, I had to acquire some clothes in some interesting ways, I'll say. I don't want to put it out there how I do it, but I had to get it. You know, I had to have the latest. I had to have the greatest. I had to have everything out of GQ magazine that came out like that month. I had to get those clothes. So I did get some of it, but also I had to get a girlfriend to cover the fact that where I was getting all these clothes from. But that had to be a part of my mission is the look, because you got in places with the look, you know, for sure. Uh, probably very similar. California's probably work operates like that, too, especially when you're trying to make it as an actor or something. You got to have that that look. Right. Definitely. Right. On the restaurant, waiting tables. You still have to, like, put on your thing. So I knew how to do that. I had to close out the look. I started going to the city and uh, the famous day that I met Keith Herring, because I don't want to bore anybody out there, is that I found the pop shop. After maybe a year or two, it's probably 1985, 86, about that time. Again, I'm finding myself in parks, uh, Union Square Park. I used to pass out there a lot, and, and I didn't know how to get to Washington Square Park yet. So I spent, wasted a whole year hanging out in Union Square Park thinking it was Washington Square Park, not knowing Andy Warhol's factory was right there. <laughs> right. Like, right. I, just. In hindsight, it was right there. So I'm hanging right out the outside window of Andy Warhol's factory, all zonked out. So the year after that, <laughs> 86, I finally found Washington Square Park. And I said, oh, this is great. You know, I started seeing people more like me, or at least felt they looked like me and, and, and had the same kind of feeling. There were musicians everywhere that still happen to play. And, you know, NYU supports that park in a way that, you know, it's just a community. Yeah. So you can hang out there and you have you can meet friends and, and just be cool. So I did that for another year and I found the pop shop and I used to hang out there and I used to ask this little chubby round guy all the time. He's the manager. It's like I didn't even know what Keith looked like. You know, I knew I seen images in the subway and the dog was my attraction because my neighborhood here is called Dog Patch. Mm -hmm. So when I seen that dog, I was like, I got to meet this dude like he he's this black guy. You know, he's doing this graffiti in the subways. I got to meet him. You know what I mean? So I find his store and I'm talking with the management and asking him, does he come in? When does he come in? And I was just catching the train, going to New York, like maybe twice out of the week, just trying to like get to meet Keith Haring, you know? Yeah. So 
finally, the guy says, well, he's doing this photo shoot. I'm doing an album or doing a record called Crack is Whack. Do you want to be a part of this photo shoot? And I said, sure. So he said, okay, well, you know, bring some of your art, bring some pictures of your artwork. Keith might be there. Well, I was okay. So speed up. We're at the photo shoot. Tenzin Kwan Chi, the famous photographer, Keith's documentor, was there with a few people. And we were setting up to do the photo shoot. And I had brought some beer. You know, I had my goodies with me in my pocket, you know, ready and all that. So we're doing the shoot. <laughs> we're doing Polaroids, first of all. And I was getting bored to death because the guy was like, can you do this? Can you move here and do that? And there were only about eight of us or 10 of us or something like that. So we were waiting for a big crowd, but it didn't happen. And so we're shooting Polaroids. And then we took a break and I'm drinking my beer. And this is all written down in one of my stories. So my meeting of Keith is actually published. But Keith pulls up with this Spanish guy, which was Juan, Juan Rivera number one, or it was three of them, but Juan Rivera number one on a bicycle. And Keith came right to me. I now think that maybe he thought I was Basquiat. <laughs> maybe. Because he came directly to me on his bike and he said, oh, wow, cool. You guys got beer. And he looks at me, comes up to me and he looks and, he, and I hand him the beer. I didn't know it was Keith. Yeah, he's a white guy, skinny white guy. <laughs> right, you thought he was black this whole time. <laughs> I, mean, I thought he was black guy. I'm waiting for this black guy. I'm like, who's this skinny white guy who's kind of corny looking? You know, for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and he had these jeans on there, kind of too much overdone, like too many patches and stuff. It was like overdone, yeah. like a white guy trying to be over too much of a b boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. He kind of overdid it. Only thing was missing was gold chains. So. <laughs> He's with the Spanish guy, and they pull with up. The big and, I give him a beer, and then Quan Chi says, "Hey Keith, where do you think we should should we do this? There's not that many people." And I was like, "Oh shit, it's him." <laughs> Paradigm shift. It's him, right? I'm like him. That's the guy. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I, hum- I humbled myself. I was just kind of like, "Oh man, all right." So. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm expecting to meet somebody like Fat Five, you know, like, somebody, right, right, right. you know, cool car or somebody. Yeah. Was cute. <laughs> and um, I gave him the beer, he drank it, he gave it back to me. And I was just like, nobody's going to believe this. This is the first thing that goes in my head and it has been ever since. Nobody's going to believe this. So we do the photo shoot, which took, I don't know how long, right? Patty has one picture. I gifted her a picture from the shoot that took me 30 years to find. Because the archive, the guy died. Like everybody died. That was my problem again. Was everybody died? Yeah, in New York. So how were when Keith was? He was sick. He didn't even tell me. But again, we hung out for the last three years of his life. But Wait, was he sick he at was, this point when you met him? Yeah, but he didn't tell me. Yeah, yeah. So the thing was, he invited me back to the studio. We're hanging out and we're getting to know each other. And I don't know if you, if I should say this. I guess it has to come out eventually. Is that, you know, we almost get into a, to a fight over uh, him uh, coming on to me. Okay. And we're in the studio, and 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 he's working on this large painting, and the thing was like twenty feet long and all that. And I'm amazed just to even be in the studio, right? So the guy's like painting this painting and I'm saying, nobody's going to believe this. And like, he's got a skateboard in there too. Can I ride your skateboard around the studio? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So I'm riding around looking at all these oh, masterpieces. This is our collection. I'm looking at real Warhols. I'm looking at like all this stuff going, nobody's going to believe this. <laughs> so. He, you don't have he, a camera just, phone with you. Either. Don't have a camera. Don't have none of this not modern technology things these kids have these days. Plus, you probably would have been too scared to even pull it out, you know, because you sure. mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the most famous artists in the world. You're hanging out in the studio. You're like, uh, what do I do? Yeah, no self. I got to ask permission. So he's working on the painting and he starts coming on. I mean, he starts, you know, doing this little routine and takes off his shirt and all this. And I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm feeling a little warm or whatever. I'm hot. Where are you hot? And I'm like, no. So <laughs> he's 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 trying to and he's tell me more about yourself. You have a girlfriend, and the girlfriend thing comes up, and I go, oh, sh- no, I don't have a girlfriend. I said, but I have a baby. And he's like, how do you have a baby? You don't have a girlfriend. And I had to explain that story, which I won't tell you guys. It's too long. But anyway, my daughter was just born, probably two or three years. Carrie, we know so, how you got a baby. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, after the yeah. Playboy Club. I mean, we like, can put it together. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Please, so, please continue. Oh. Yeah. So the guy, you know, the guy explains, uh, I'll explain my life to him briefly. I'm 22, 23, 24, something like that. He's 20, I think he's 30, 30, 29. Or, I don't know. Anyway, there's a six year age gap between me and him. Yeah. So he's coming on to me. I told him, cut it out. He kept doing it. And I was like, dude, stop, stop, dude. I, you know, I'm, I'm straight. So, so he, one more time he came at me and I was like, listen, I don't care how famous you are, how much money you have. I'm from Trenton. I said, not only will I beat you up, I'll rob you. There's nobody here. I'll, I'll, I'll rob you. I'm saving that one. I said, right? I'll rob you. Just leave, so cut it out. You know, <laughs> like, oh so he's like, God. okay, okay. He's like, I just want you to respect me as an artist and I'll respect you. And I was like, yeah, that's cool, man. But just don't come at me with that stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with it. I don't care what you do. I'm not peeking through your keyhole or nothing. I'm just like, just don't come at me. Yeah. So that day was really important in the sense that I thought he was going to throw me out after that tiff, right? And and getting it straight, whether he was going to get at me or not. I'm like, nah, I'm not. I'm sleeping with you, man. So we sat around, hung around. I mean, he had the best pot in the world. I mean, he had <laughs> he had everything. I'm just kind of like sitting there saying to myself, again, no one's going to believe this. So <laughs> he takes me out to lunch. And he's like, you hungry? I'm going, yeah, I could use a little something to eat. I got the munchies and stuff. So so we leave and we walk down to the Acme, which is now some new restaurant. But again, hindsight, it's across the street from Basquiat's studio. Right? Oh, wow. I don't know this stuff, but I'm with him and I'm eating my food and he's schooling me, just telling me everything. Like almost in rapid succession, like I'm talking now, like, look, you have to do this. You want to be this? You want to do that? You're going to have to do this. You're going to do that. You got to meet people. You got to blah, blah, blah. I'm just sitting on, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, so we eat halfway through our hamburgers. He jumps up from the table and says, we got to go. And I'm thinking they're going to shoot him because we were talking about Lennon at the time. Mm-hmm. And I, and there's a little story. Again, I wish I could tell you guys everything about this, but I told him he looked like John Lennon a little way and remind me of a hippie and you know, and this Yoko Ono thing came up and he's like, oh, Yoko's a friend of mine. I'm like, oh, cool. So we eat our food. He jumps up. I'm thinking they're going to shoot him or whatever. We run. He's like, I'll go back to the studio. We got to finish. So we run back and he's just getting telling me, it's like, look, you got to know to do this. You have to do that. And I'm like, just listening to the guy. But literally he's telling me how to make it. And I'm like, all right. So we go back, hang out a little more. And then I'm like, this is like a I'm crash like, course, man. You cra- super crash course. This is one day we're talking about. I oh, was wow. like, as soon as we get back to the studio, I'm like, give me this, give me that. Because nobody's going to believe me. When I go back home, no one is going to believe what just happened to me, right? Yeah. Now, if you guys seen that big painted chair he did like with grace jones like that it's like this man chair and it's like he's like it's really funky looking and it's like he painted it so that was like the first thing in the studio and it's a very large sculpture i'm like i want that <laughs> like a big <laughs> kid i want that he's like you can't have that then i see the big absolute advertisement he did right for absolute mm-hmm. vodka he's like one yeah. of the first artists that's a ten thousand dollar campaign I almost got one. I was like, well, I would have been the fourth artist to get one, but they turned me down. But anyway, um, I wanted that. I'm like, give me that. He's like, you can't have that. That belongs to Absolute. So everything in the studio now that I'm happy and I'm fed, right? Give me this. Give me that. I want that. Give me that. <laughs> oh, what's this? He's like, don't touch this. Don't touch that. I'm running around that studio now thinking, okay, I got to get something. Right. Yeah. So he did give me some few things and I came home. But from that day on, man, I had a hard time. Up and up to them now. Then he wanted to believe me that I had these experiences. And now we jump to Basquiat and the mistaken identity stuff. Yeah. I would be in clubs. And I didn't know why it was so easy for me to get through the velvet rope. Right? This is all hindsight. Now, I'm flowing through. I'm going club to club. I'm going in. They're dropping the rope. How you doing tonight? You know, I'm bringing friends up now because they're confident to come with me to hang out. But they're still not believing me about the Keith Haring stuff and everything. So we just did the club stuff. But they didn't know and how I was getting in these nightclubs and getting them in for free. It's like, how are you doing this, man? And I'm like, I don't know. We're in shit. Like, let's just yeah, yeah. enjoy ourselves. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> like, or I would get a name from the inside or get the D oh, is so-and-so here. And they'd be like, Oh, is he expecting you? And I go, yeah. And they just drop the rope and let me in. Right. Oh God, so, I'm, so I'm living this life. I'm being led in nightclubs. I'm going to VIP rooms and things. I'm not having too much of a problem. Now one night I'm at dance interior and by myself, because oftentimes no one would come from Jersey to come into New York because they were too scared, you know, and I was living a kind of a risky lifestyle. So I'm at Dance Interior one night and I was on one of the floors. It was a four story floor building with a rooftop. You could hang out. That was like the premier. If you could get to a club like that, you know, get to the roof, you know, you were all that in a bag of chips. So I'm hanging out and I pull out my joint and I'm listening to the music and I light up my joint and I'm standing there and listening, bobbing my head, smoking my J. And actually, you know, there's this woman standing on the other side of the room. And she catches my eye, I catch her. She's staring at me. Now she's starting to scowl a little bit. And I'm like, uh-oh, what's, what's her problem? <laughs> so I just continued, you know, I said, maybe she's going to come over and dance with me or something, you know? Maybe she's going to ask me for a hit of my joint. So she comes barreling over and literally slams me down, knocks me on my ass. Like, the joint goes flying. I'm like, so I fall <laughs> down on the ground and I roll. And I, first thing, I'm going to look for my joint. Like, I'm like, where's my joint? So I'm crawling on the dance floor and I find my joint. The girl just disappears into nowhere. And I get up, you know, people look around. I'm looking, I'm like, what the fuck was that all about? Like, so now in hindsight, again, I'm going, this must have been a, 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 a lover of John's who in the dark thought it was me or, or I was him. Wow. And she was pissed yeah. that maybe I had ignored her or whatever. Hey, maybe Carrie, real quick. The night before. Okay, real quick. For some reason, my thing cut out. Who who was it? The woman I never knew. It was just some woman. Oh, who okay. Was in, I thought you were going to say club. it was like Madonna or something. Oh, God. No, but I got to remember <laughs> that story. I'm not going to tell that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to. She, she didn't like me. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't. She didn't like me. She didn't. I don't know what. But how could she not like me and date John? But I guess because I look like him or something. Maybe. It yeah. yeah. It was, But she wasn't famous yet. When, when that was going down, when I met her and I was with Keith, you know, so the thing was, I got slammed. I got in clubs for free. I, 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 I moved around and not knowing that I had this similarity, which it's been confirmed by many people. It's always happening in New York. It still does. Even uh, John's assistant, Stephen Torton, who I met last year, we're real tight now. We met last year and even he's like, you know, it's weird, but yeah, you look like them. Your skin is just better. I got to be honest. When I first <laughs> saw you on Zoom, I was like, "This is like what Basquiat would look like if he was still here today." <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, right, right, exactly. You know what I mean? Because he's only three years older than me, so right, right. Yeah, he, he would be gray, and I don't know if he would still have dreads or not or anything like that. But you know, if I put a little blemish like on one side of my face, man, I'd be in trouble because you know, people would think, you know, it's just ghosty. Was he resurrected from the dead? Right, Did like he ever die? Was an it, Elvis was it, thing. Yeah, was it a ploy? You know what I mean? And yeah. speaking of that too, Preston and Mike, Larry Gagosia, speaking of blue chip gallerists. Oh man, yeah. Gagosian one night literally did the same thing that woman did to me at a party at for artist space. <laughs> Oh wow! Uh, he, in the '90s. Now this is probably five years after John's death, but I'm at this fundraiser and Larry Gagosian's way across the room, and he's staring at me just like that woman, and he comes barreling over, and I didn't have a joint in my hand this time. <laughs> I'm sorry. He didn't say a word and just simply came over and he kind of nudged me, I guess, to see if I was actually real in the flesh or something like. And he bumped me and he never said another word to me. Oh wow! And he just left. And just wow. recently, I went to his gallery up on Madison Avenue. The same thing. Like, I had this whole crew of, of black suits and big wielders and dealers. I'm walking around a gallery looking at Basquiat's show. And they're all just in the same room with me. And it's like we're playing not musical chairs, but musical rooms. Like, I'm on one side of the room. They're always on the opposite side of the room. But no one ever approaches and say, who are you or how are you doing? Or so it's like this. So they stare and disappear. Wow. Or I get photobombed all the time now. It's ridiculous. Sure. Well, yeah. man, what a story, man. That's that's amazing. I wanted to quickly take a break, if you guys don't mind, and stop the recording and make sure we got this audio. I want to make sure that uh, 
we got yeah, a lot of stories. Down, you know what I mean? <laughs> lock it down. And then um, if you don't mind, I'll send you both a link and we can we can start uh, part two. I got a couple questions for you that I think will be good for some artists coming up and for cool. people who don't know you. Are you guys good with that? I'm up for it. I'm chilling like a villain. I love it. All I love right. it. So I'm going to pause this for a sec. Yeah, I can hear you and stuff. Gary. Talking, talking yes. about ourselves is fun. Talking is not ours. <laughs> No, man, it's fun having you on here. I'm glad you're having a good time. And um, it's one of those things where I love it because, first of all, I dig you as a human being and and as an artist in general. But also it's nice to hear these stories to kind of live vicariously through you. I wasn't wasn't able to come up in the New York art scene over there, and I always fantasized about it. So it's kind of fun uh, hearing your stories and being able to to put myself in your place. Yeah, it's nice to tell it and to someone that it matters to. Yeah. Meaning you and whoever else can listen who had not had a chance to experience any of it and just saw a movie or, you know, uh, in a clip or, you know, let's say Hollywood down yeah, version right. of it. Um, but <laughs> the reality is nice to tell because a lot of people just kind of gloss over it. Did you ever see the movie that Julian Schnabel made, uh, another 80s artist about Basquiat, the Basquiat movie? Yes, his version, yes. He, did, he's, you, did you think that, that was accurate? No. Okay. Interesting. It is a, it's a Hollywood version of a character, if that makes sense to anybody, meaning it's a character created. It's not him. Yeah. He's right. the character. Yes. Right? So everything that happens within that character's life is all up to the producer and director's script and how they want that to kind of come out. Right. Mm-hmm. So I don't have any objections to the movie. I like Julian's style. I definitely like him. And I'm not going to diss him since I've met him last year. Yeah. You know, so, uh, that's a nice story, too. But anyway, um, yeah, the movie, I enjoyed it because it at least got him out to the public. Mm-hmm. Now, the double edged sword is people have a weird sense of who he really was because there's too much emphasis on the drugs. Oh, yeah. Well, and there's also a lot of stuff I read about him that they didn't even touch on. Right. And you only have an hour and so many minutes to make a film to make it believable and have some kind of either happy ending or a sad one. So, you know, unfortunately, he went with the leave you hanging in the you think about what you saw type of about that person. But, you know, um. The reality is, you know, again, we can go back to the hustle and the beast coast and someone trying to make it through that so-called concrete jungle and getting up. Yes. That I think, requires I think there's one. Yes, yeah, sorry, good. I was just going to say that requires a little bit more than what that movie could 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 illustrate. Yeah. I thought for me, the, the opening was powerful and just that it was, it started with, I can't remember the name of the critic. Now you probably remember his name, but he's writing. About, um, um, the writer was um, supposed to be Rene Ricard. Rene. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he was writing about how it's the artist's job to get their work out in the public, in the public eye. So they can be aware of it. Um, I thought that part was really interesting and still holds true today, whether that's, you know, on the street or, um, yes, social media. It does. You know. That is those words. Now the words in the film, I really enjoyed because if you really listen, I've probably watched it 10 times and I could watch it again is that some of those words are, they ring very true, you know, because again, you have an artist who produced the film, so he knows what it takes to get in his position. I'm speaking of Julian, of course, so he threw a little bit of himself in there too with the struggle with trying to be recognized. Cause you know, he was a chef, a cook and everything in New York before he actually be, hit some success. Yes. So, you know, the movie really is about the, the, the avenue to success and everything else in the middle, you could pretty much fill in with anybody. Exactly. You know, yeah. you know what's interesting, Carrie, about the avenue to success and, and everything you guys are talking about. Uh, we we had I had this conversation with Patty when we were working on her show at the gallery. You know, I asked her at some point uh, when all that was happening, did you guys realize what was happening? And she's like, No, like we we were just partying and having a good time, and it was 
was unfolding around us, you know? Right. And right. It's, it's in retrospect that you realize, you know, you know, the magnitude of it all. And I feel that with Shockbox, you know, we've had, uh, we've had at least 50 group shows at this point, you know, mm -hmm. and, and each show has 25 to 50 artists in it. So there's been a lot of people come through. And in any show, there's maybe only one or two new artists that stand out in that way where you feel them, you know, where they come in and they've got this personality, they've got this style that backs up their artwork. And you think like there's a whole package, you know, and so yeah. many other artists that, that are missing one of those components that uh, the, the fact that you were, you know, you were around several of them that had the whole package was, was pretty powerful, Carrie. Well, that's nice. I, I, you know, you brought up that package. That that's that's very important. The package. I mean, mm -hmm. we we could we could use that as a metaphor for you know, pretty much any profession, right? You say you have to have a package to present yourself to the world. So yes, you know, your package got to be tight, and I got to get a little. Uh, let me throw some slang in there too, because I like to. You know, you got you got your package has got to be tight, meaning yeah. Your gear is up, like we left off in the last segment. You gotta have your gear up, you gotta have your look up. And the only way you're gonna do that is to know where you wanna go. Because if you get dressed for the wrong party, I mean, come on. That's yeah, true. You, 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 right. mentioned, you mentioned Madonna and yeah, you know, say what you want about Madonna. And we were watching the other night, you know, the end of the year comes and CNN has all those retrospectives of what it was like oh. in the eighties or what it was like in the seventies. And they, they were showing some footage of Madonna back in those mud club days. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and that, I mean, I just love, she knew where she was going. She mm -hmm. was determined. She looked in the camera and she said, I'm mm -hmm. taking over the world. And, and mm -hmm. somebody who's continuously been able to stay in front mm -hmm. of it, in front of the wave, like you got to respect that. And adapt, yeah. Yes. Well, she she'd already plotted her course. She knew the whole way. Yes, you know. Yes, she she when she left Michigan, she she had a vision, just Definitely. like any of us. I'll say this: just like any of us who left any particular town or any city and came went into New York, mm -hmm. you had a vision because if you didn't, you're gonna get swallowed up so quick and so fast. <laughs> you might as well keep your suitcase packed. Yeah. What do they say? Carrie, what do they say? Trent Trenton makes and the world takes. Trenton makes the world takes. I mean, <laughs> you know, some of us have <laughs> lost that type of verve. I'm swear to God, the only two million of us that came out of there can really hold that banner, man, and wave it for, proudly. And that's I'm glad I hooked up with you guys over there on the West. Cause I totally now can take that and wave it proud. You know, I can print it on my underwear. You know, it's like <laughs> it's real. Yeah, and that's a good idea for a show, Preston. I that's love it. Show. Yeah, the underwear I, show. The white. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the white. Oh, don't get the me whites. started, Mike. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a I lingerie love... freak. There you go. Camo <laughs> yeah, brand. That's Here we go. One of my, that's another one of my artistic passions. You know, we don't have time to talk about that. But again, back to Madonna. Okay, since you guys said I can let it fly, right? Let it fly. <clears throat> we're doing the year in review, and we're talking about real life. You know. Madonna did have a, a vision and a mission. And the thing was, you know, some people don't care who they step on to get there. That's what right, I don't like. Right. About it. You know, and, and and once you start climbing ladder, some people just kick the rung out from underneath and say, oh, well, you know, I just keep it moving. And yeah. they don't look back. OK, that's so true. So my experience with her is just that when I was with Keith. Hanging out when I first met him and we were like kind of he was taking me on little errands and shit like that. You know, like basically going to the bank. He taught me how to go. To, he took taking me to the bank. I met Jeffrey Dice. Jeffrey Dice don't even know that he met me. He did. If I ever see him in life, I'm gonna say, "Dude, I met you at Citibank." Blah blah blah. But keep. I'm gonna break it down to him. But <laughs> the thing is, um, Madonna had this mission, and we would hang out, and I'd be Keith, and she'd approach, and she might be with somebody like Sandra Bernhardt. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was a girl. So I see them walking out 8th Street or whatever, something like that, coming off his direction, or I'd be with Keith. And they all jump all over Keith. And I was just like another one of Keith's boys Yeah, is what I didn't like right now. She saw me without Keith. My, I'm hanging in Washington Square Park one evening. 
And she was headed to the fun house to go get with Jelly Bean, Benitez, right? You know, to cut mm-hmm. that record. Yeah. And um, she approached me, you know, with her crew because she was hanging out with the Spanish, little Puerto Rican girls and stuff like that. And she tried to play her. She was a Puerto Rican girl. She acted like she was a Spanish Italian girl from Brooklyn. She told me her name was Madge from Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. It wasn't Madonna from Michigan. It was Madge from Brooklyn, right? So I'm in the park. So you got any pot with that voice? You know that. You know everybody <laughs> knows Madonna's voice. Any pot? I was just like, no, go over there to the Rastas. You know that's where right. I got mine. Like I'm like no. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going, she always hung out with the cute girls and everything and whatnot. But <clears throat> that got her in the clubs. But Madonna had a very interesting shield she would use to protect herself out there. And it was very smart. And I'm going to tell you guys, Mm -hmm. she had hairy armpits and she'd walk around funky. Very French. Very French. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, you thought twice, right? Interesting. So she's in control. So if you had any attraction towards her, you know what I mean? You just, you were kind of stood up. Wait, she's a little funky. Something's up. So you, you know, <laughs> so that was smart, man. Out there in the street at night, you know, in the clubs and whatnot. And everybody brings up these BJs in the bathroom. I don't know if she did that or not. But if she did, it was for a reason. It yeah. wasn't because yeah. she was trying to have fun. Right. You know, she was working her way up. That's, so why, that's, I, that's I mean. why I have hairy armpits and stay funky too. Right? I, I got to keep people at a distance, you know? I don't think exactly. that works for men, Mike. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for men that way. You know, you're a derelict, right? Gary, away, that's, like, Gary, that's why I wax my armpits. Oh, yeah. man. You, listen, I go, Brazil. I go Brazil all the way. I learned my lesson. I'm international. This way, I don't get fooled by anybody. You're like, right? oh, you Brazilian? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Oh, so this is a dolphin, though. baby. Yeah, that's right. Slick as a seal. So the thing is, she that was her guard, man, and she used that. That's a tool. So that's a very interesting tool to have in your box when you're trying to walk that avenue. Yeah. I, I had you know? no, I never heard that before. That's and, really and, interesting. And, and, and then you've got, you know what I mean? You got your shield with your girls, like you surround yourself with a bunch of girls and everything like that. So you got both sexes covered. All that, man. She rode right down the middle, if you think about it. <clears throat> Androgynous. She had it all covered, you know? Yeah, yeah. She's That's got true. culture. She's a very culture. She's, I call it lassoing, which is a friend of mine's term. We call it lasso. Is when we go out <clears throat> and we cultivate people. Mm-hmm. So we call it lassoing. And I've done that in the past five years. And that's how I lasso Patty, <laughs> which is yeah. nice. <laughs> because... Yeah. Indirectly, I was supposed to be delivering a message in New York City, and and I had borrowed twenty bucks, and I knew Patty Astor was doing this lecture, and I had went directly to her. You know what I mean? Like I knew she was speaking at NYU about something about the eighties or whatever, and I was like, "Shit, I'm getting my ass together, sick or not," and and going after Patty, like I went after Keith and everybody else. You know, it's just like I said, she has to know she's the only one that could put my life in context. Yeah. You know, by giving me a show and she could, you know, just carry Patty asked her, oh, shit. OK, what did what did Carrie do to deserve Patty's attention? Mm-hmm. You know, so so again, Madonna did her thing. And that's really a good example, minus the funk. Of what you have to do is be laser beam focused. Yeah, you can have fun. But sometimes, like I said, she didn't really do drugs. You know what I'm saying? She didn't get into that. Her friend, everybody around her, she would watch. Maybe she'd play it off. I've been in rooms with people getting high, and I did. I faked it. You know what I mean? It's like, no, nah, yeah. act like I did it because people were doing some heavy shit. You know, you yeah. weren't cool if you didn't snort some heroin or something like that. And you just, I'm like, hell no, I'm not doing that. You know? Yeah, that's why. Just you're like still I wasn't here. gonna sex. Just like I wasn't gonna sex myself through life. Right. You know yeah. I mean? Like that was right. another thing about the '80s. Some people went oh, that route. Yeah. You know, and and men, uh, men and women, men yeah. and yeah, it's, yeah. It's, see, it's, that's the world we live in. People don't understand. There's no gender. No. Uh, there's there's no way you can define people's gender and what they do, vice versa, or whatever, and 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 tag people based on whether you look and shit like that. You know, we gotta change all that because yeah. someone's yeah. agenda is totally. It could be calculated. 
Mm-hmm. You know, like Definitely. he's like he like those real. That's how those serial killer people get away with stuff. It's like you don't know they were planning to get twenty six people. Most people <laughs> think maybe one. You know, they're pissed off and they kill that person or oh, whatever. But this person had a plan to go for twenty six. We didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, hey, let me yeah. let me uh, to bring it back. Not so morbid. You know what I mean? When you're when you're on this avenue, which I've learned in hindsight is that, you know, if you're not laser focused, there's plenty of distractions along the way. There's plenty of interesting things to see. There's plenty of things you can say, hmm, that sound looks interesting or that sounds tempting or that might be a way to go. Um, I wouldn't try to be experiment with too many branches on the tree you know what i mean like you got to stay straight for sure well i you wanted know, to kind of underline some, yeah good let me add something to that um put my other hat on you know i'm a psychologist too right oh <laughs> here we no. go and, and now actually, carrie carrie get your wallet up yeah uh, no, I, what, how you're much, about, uh, <laughs> what, what you're talking about has me thinking of a few things is that it's you know somewhat specific to the art world, you have some people that are passing through, like they're just going to try it for a minute, but their life doesn't depend on it, you know? And then there's Mm -hmm. people probably like you, Carrie, or if we talk about Basquiat or Keith Haring or Madonna or uh, people that we know, Preston, that come through Shockbox. Some people are, are, are doing this because that's, they have to do that, that their life depends on on creating art and being authentic and that, and this is their place in the world. I used yeah. to see it uh, even back in the skateboard world. I had a couple of friends that their, their only ticket out of the, the, the rough beginnings that they had in their life and the town that we the were ghetto. growing up in was that skateboard. You know what I mean? And, oh, and yeah. the kids that were, the kids that were on the fringe that were getting too high or getting too drunk or fucking around. They, they, you know, the, my buddies that made it into the magazines and, and have great lives now because of it, they weren't doing that. They might have a beer, but they weren't drinking the whole 12 pack, you know, cause they were like, no, that's right. Kidding. And yeah, um, they wanted to escape. Yeah. The focus. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I think so that's, that's a great um, example, Mike, and a great, um, um, cause it is a skating is part of my life too. So as soon as you start talking skate, which is, I, I go back flashback right away. You know what I mean? To actually knowing what that deck and those wheels meant to me. But being able to be transported out of, okay, my home wasn't a terrible home. It's kind of middle class and stuff, but still it didn't provide enough for me or cr- creatively to actually, you know, be myself. Because the old things I got on the board to try to find out who I was, right? That's what I think that's what everybody leaves to try to do is find out who they are. And and that's the, the journey. Yeah. Whether you become whatever, you know, but I was fortunate enough to find out who I was early. Like I was fighting to maintain who I was. It seems to me in hindsight that I had so many um, hurdles and so many just things coming at me negatively that I had to like kind of duck and dodge and say, no, you know, I'm not into that. I'll go as far as back to saying I wasn't even into church, man. Like they tried to make me take communion you know, I had a conniption and disrupted the whole church. And I think that's pretty much where the support stopped for me in terms of family. It's like, no, this, he's not even biting, biting church. Mm. So what are we going to do with this kid? <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, think about this visually. You're an artist. You're a little kid. And you have this image, stained glass. It could have been Tiffany or whatever. But there's this Jesus figure. And this guy's got this lamb in his hand. You know, and there's this guy standing there with this red juice talking about this is the flesh and the blood. I was like, I'm not going to eat anybody's flesh and I'm not drinking anybody's blood. You can have that. <laughs> like, I don't care what it means. I don't care if it's med- It seems like cannibalism to me. It was, it was like I'm joining a cult. I was like, oh, no. So I independently as a child divorced myself for that entire thing that almost 90 percent of people are into to be myself. And I've had to fight for that ever since because when people like, my family are like, okay, if you're not going to believe this, then we don't believe nothing. You're coming out of your mouth or whatever. But that know? shows so some I, clarity at a young age, you know, like knowing what you want. A lot of people have, a, have struggles without even into adulthood figuring out, oh, should I really be a part of this? I don't, do I really believe this? And I wanted to underline one other thing that you said, which is with that laser focus, also just having the confidence to know who you're going for 
target that person and go, look, I'm going to be part of this person's world, whether it's Keith Haring yep. or whether it's Patty Astor, like you said, having the guts to follow through on that because fear is what holds a lot of us back, right? Yes. Fear, fear is something that is always on your left shoulder. Like, you know, you see it in the cartoons, whether it's the angel or the devil or whatever, you know, you could look at that either way. Mike probably could attest to the psychological <laughs> aspect of that. But I'm just saying, you always have that level of fear that has, to, it's like self-generated because there's really mm-hmm. nothing, nothing there other than your own thoughts about it. So your perspective yeah. is like, I'm afraid of that, but. Well, you know, you know, Carrie, you said, you got you you know i want to there's something here too around skateboarding that i want to get back to uh but that fear for certain people is i think it's a fear of of evaporating or of not being known or of being invisible right and i think you get in yes. you get into the art world like i can remember um my introduction into sort of like all of it was that skateboard scene and you know you would get those paint pens and start writing on your skateboards or on your sneakers or yeah. spray painting on a ramp, you know? And it's like that, whatever that mark was, was this, that is was me, your mark that this is me. I'm here. Right. Like that's my yep. thing. And yep. whether you were writing some political slogan or you were making your own tag, or you were just, you know, doing something abstract, there was this, yeah. like, there was this desire to be an individual, but there was this huge importance of the collective, right. Of like, I'm a yeah. skater now, like this is my crew. Yeah, it's and community Mike, and identity. But yeah, Mike, I want to add add something. If I just want to interject a bit and add something really simple, because because I'm flowing with you. Just think about carving that line no one carved in the bowl. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That was huge. Or 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 a new move. Like if you did something off the coping back in the day, anything was like yeah. you were the king. You were the king of the skate park. If you pulled you off know, any anything at all you know there was yes and there's a there's something about that here's a great segue for the thanks for saying that carrie there's something about that community that skate community and i think it exists you can see it to the day if you go by a skate park today there's a celebration of everybody if your boy does something that you're trying to do before you you're stoked you know and you're 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 high-fiving him you're slapping your deck on the coping uh, yeah, and 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 seeing him do it makes you believe that you can do it. It's sort of the exactly. opposite. Like you said the crabs in a bucket, and the other thing, yeah. the other thing that skateboarding brought. I'm going to segue Preston into what we were talking about with yeah um, for sure with Carrie's show. The other thing that I feel like skateboarding played a huge role in is that you go back to the 70s and 80s, and at least for me, right? I'm a I'm a a white kid that grew up on, on the, on the wealthier side of the tracks, right? Um, that skateboard, when you would go find that empty swimming pool, everybody was there. There were, there were rich kids there. There were poor mm-hmm. kids there. There were latchkey mm-hmm. kids there. There were mm-hmm. punk rockers, heavy metal kids, long hairs, short hairs, black, white, Latino, you name it, you know? Yeah, and, definitely. Yeah. And, 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 and artistically and musically, there was something happening where like, I can remember that's where I heard music. This is before the beastie boys, right? Like grandmaster mm-hmm. flash and, oh, yeah. and stuff like that. And so you would mm-hmm. have this, like whatever music was playing in the pool, there was just this exposure. To you listen so to much. it. Yeah. You listen like to I'm, it. I've got a spray paint can and I'm going to write Devo. <laughs> on the <side laughs> right, of the swimming pool, right. Well, but then there's somebody else that's like, no, this is how you use that spray paint can, right? And everybody just like got cool with everybody. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, imagine me. I now flip it and say, okay, I'm a black kid <clears throat> growing up. I was the only, always the black, only black kid, and all of my my tribes that I found along the way that actually were cool, right? Mm-hmm. Because skating was like taboo, and what are you on a skateboard? And, you know, kids with long hair do that. You don't do that, you know, type thing. Right. So I had to run out and find my tribe in skating, you know. And once I did, again, that camaraderie, that that cheering, that that just acceptance. And then if I again pulled off something fantastic, you know, no one got jealous, no one got right. salty, no one tried to like 
adjust my trucks so the next time I go out, I get an accident. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> see, that happens over here. I mean, North Korea, people will do things to sabotage your your, yeah. your flow and your line, you know what I mean? So oh, you yeah. have to leave those people, which I have finally, I would say, you know, in the past year, I finally recognized that is that, you know, I still was hanging on to some of them people, man, that was trying to like, to put a wrench in my trucks, like, you know, loosen my wheels and stuff, you know? And I'm like, I, I can't, I already have enough problems. I can't, I got to focus laser again, back to what I'm doing and say, you're not a skateboarder anymore. You're an artist. You know, or I used to be a and we can talk into mountain biking too. You're not a mountain biker anymore. You're an artist. So long, I had to whittle, whittle it down to who, who I really am, which is that creator guy, man. You're that guy who likes to make things happen and likes to, like, produce things. And you really inevitably want to tell the world you exist. Yeah. Hello? Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, and there's, there's freedom in that. Hello, Gary. You're there. Funky here, you're there. Okay, you're here. Good. Well, it's interesting. Um, if you guys can hear me. Stop me if you can't. If you can't hear me, you won't stop me because you can't hear me. But uh, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep flowing with it. Um, speaking a little bit about race, um, have you have you seen anything change? Because especially right now, we got a bunch of races kind of come to the forefront. Have you seen opportunities for uh, black artists change over the years, or do you think we're still kind of <laughs> in the same? Let me, let me give it to my little chuckle because I don't want make people to think that I'm making light or fun of this, what you're asking me. But um, I read a lot. You know, mm-hmm. I'm reading, you know, Art in America. I, I get all the, I read all everything all the way up to art, the art newspaper, you know, the world's international art newspaper and all that kind of stuff. And everyone's talking about it. Everyone's showing everyone. Everyone's trying to find an African American artist, uh, right. and, and they basically are coming fresh out of graduate school. So it's like it's like a cultivating type of thing, you know. It's like somebody's investing, all right. So that's one aspect of it is the investment in the particular individual to graduate, and now they're automatically in the market, which I don't like about that. Because okay, so hang on, likes- hang on one second. I like this a lot. So is this something? So you're thinking that this is for uh selfish purposes almost this is not an organic thing that they're trying to cultivate this is a market that should have been cultivated a long time ago it's just that everyone's playing catch up right right right, right. so you're getting this that the stream is being fed but it's mm-hmm. on this graduate level man and it's like you know master master of arts degree level type of thing where it's a huge investment being made you know what i mean because and i hate to say this but there's a lot of student loan boners out there you know Oh, so yeah. People got to pay their debts and they'll get in a situation and sign a contract with a gallery knowing that they have to pay that student loan debt. And if the gallery is willing to pay that debt and say, OK, you give me 10 paintings annually, you got a career now. That's what I, that's where I'm like, shit, I come from the grassroots dirt kind of I do have a technical background, mm-hmm. you know, but that's not credited with a degree which says I'm now worth money. <clears throat> you see what I mean? Of course. So, so yes, it's great that the attention is being focused on. Yet, there's a lack of representation everywhere you go and every single aspect you think of in the entire world because of this negativity. But as far as change goes, you know that really has to come from some real hands-on experiences for individuals that have not had experiences like with the mixed culture scenes and the stuff. Those are the like what you were talking about with skateboarding. Like with, with state, well, right. We yeah. you don't have a global community like that, you know, whereas we got micro communities, but in terms of the art world, there's still this like effort being made through investment, not through this like heartfelt thing or not, not through um, just the organic aspect of meeting people at a gallery even you know what i mean because we can't do that right now so how's all this activity going on i carry i i uh you and i talked about this back uh much closer i think to the george floyd murder Uh, i struggled with i struggled with that as a gallery owner um you know shockbox had been around for about three years at that point and we have uh I've always felt like my doors open to everybody and uh, I, I didn't go to any extra length to make sure that I was including a, a, an artist of color in a show. 
but I also didn't exclude anybody. Um, you know, right. the, our gallery is in a, in a really predominantly white beach community. And, and um, when we have had several artists come through and, and, and had even, um, you know, it was, I just want, I'll stop with it. It wasn't something that we were really considering. And then when that happened, right it came really to the forefront about white privilege. Yeah. And, and, and I really did some searching. And my first reaction to it was, is I didn't want to feel like, or, or send a message out of like, you know, an email to the four black come artists on, that have recently on. shown. And <laughs> yeah, like, right. Hey, can we, can we feature come on you on down. Our You're the next contestant month? on the price. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and, but it's what like, we did do was, uh, you know, I, I did reach out to the ones that I, the, the, the artists that I, that I had a, a an existing relationship with and, and just did like a temperature check on how they felt. And, um, yeah. and, and one of my friends, his name's Deshaun. He's actually kind of blowing up right now. Scott Meskel introduced him to the gallery. He, he said uh, the first time he came to a shock box show, he's like, man, I was high and I was the only black person and I felt really out of place. And you and Scott came and, and talked to me. And, and the next time I came, I brought my whole family because it just felt real, you know, yep. and, yep. and it made, it made me really proud of what we've built at Shockbox is just something where people well, of any, any kind of divergent, either artistic or, or skin tone or, or religion or sexual orientation. But hang on though, Mike, Mike, one second though. So it's already intimidating coming into a gallery that you don't yes. know. It's but, our, yeah. no matter what, who you are. So coming and then to the throw color, that, yeah, throw that on top of it. Yeah, exactly. It's more intimidating. Is that what you're getting at? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, throwing that I, I on think top. I get, of it. Yeah, I think I see the picture there, and I know the picture very well. When you in that situation, when you're like the one, I'm not talking about just being a minority. I'm talking about just one, right? Yeah. And, and you come into a scene like that. Well, my upbringing, thank God. You know, I grew up in a super diverse neighborhood. It was a very about three or four small blocks. However. We had every cultural person represented in the world in that little block. You know, I had trouble when I went outside of the neighborhood. That's when things got funky, you know, yeah, with yeah. people calling you one specific thing. But we, I was dealing with Italians and Greeks and um, basically mostly Italian and Greek Mediterranean people. And some Eastern Europeans uh, were there. And we're talking back in the 60s. Right. So, again, I had a an edge culturally on basically 90% of the world's population because of the way I grew up. So again, I'm coming into the world like an alien almost. And I walk into scenes like New York being the only black guy or someone in the gallery. I got so used to it and so cool with it because I knew once I walked in the door, I was the show. Forget yeah. about what's on the wall. Forget about whatever. It was like, I made my presence be known in the fact I was comfortable and I seen the, how uncomfortable everyone was. And, and at one point, I used to run people around the Princeton Art Museum like sheep herd, like a sheep herder, you know. Like I'd come to an opening at the museum, which <laughs> very I got my roots planted deep in here now. So now there's a different story. But I'm going to tell you guys, I'd walk in there, and I could literally part part the waters and go to the table and get the hors d'oeuvres. You know, everybody would just spread out, you know, and I could just move them or corral them around. I would play with people like I was a real sheep herder. And I had a cane. <laughs> I do have a cane. This one, I got the tall one. But I was literally pushing people around the room. And I got it. Me and security would get a kick out of because the whole security team knows me. So I have this, this security who gives me maximum protection and all this kind of stuff, right? I'm like this big star on campus. But the people who come don't know me. So they, they're intimidated because they don't even make the chance to introduce themselves. They don't say anything. They just kind of like act the, the, the fear game, right? And I just yeah. go, ahead, you know, you do you, I'll do me. And then later you'll find out, you know, that I do belong here. But I'm not going to prove I don't have to prove it. So make a long story short, um, presenting yourself individually solely as an African-American, you have to have, first of all, you got to pick up a hell of a lot of books. What do you mean? Talk, you get this double fast talk because if you don't you can't um, enunciate, uh, you can't uh, express yourself in words. Right? What happens is you get caught talk. People start 
talking fast, you know, double talk, and they don't give you a chance to answer the first question. So it makes you seem wrong. Right? You get that. You get bombarded with English, which you probably don't know that well. At least I don't either. You know, I never tried to really try to get to get it down pat. You know, I'm just like, you know, I'll, I'll get it well enough that I can survive and, and, and speak to people. My dad was an excellent speaker. So I got a lot of this from him because mm-hmm. he was used to the public and dealing with a very professional job. So he yeah. had to speak. You know what I mean? So some people don't get the chance to, 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 to speak. And they get caught in a public situation that's maybe on a, a higher social level and you, you pretty much, well, I don't belong here. It's like, nah, just step your game up. Sure. You do. You just yeah. have to, you know, educate yourself. That's where it is. It's education. So color, whatever you are, it's all about kind of like, I say levels of knowledge mm-hmm. in which where you want to be, you know, you, you want to be a psychologist then you're going to have to pick up the books. You know what I mean? If you want to be an artist, now you're going to have to study. And you're going to have to go backwards, unfortunately. I, I hated art history, but I know so much now because I'm self-taught and I got a hell of a library here. But I had to do all this on my own and, and really, again, know me and know what I want out of this game. That's the way to do it because it can, it can be, it's presented in such a cold way when you go into school. Like, this is the person that you need to know and these are the people you need. To. You approached it from your own angle, which brings some passion into it, you know? Yes. Yes. You, you. See, I started out, I'm the same, I'm going to get a little, I'm the same OG since I was two years old. And Mm -hmm. my family, if you'd ever speak to any of them, they probably would have to confirm it now. But before they thought I was a little bit kind of the black sheep. Uh, (laughs) No pun on the word there. But yeah, I was. Yeah, it's just this kid, man, they didn't know what to do with. So my energy and control and power and strength, you know, came off from the inside. I didn't have to have someone validate me. Yeah. I think a lot of artists can relate to that too. Yeah, not even my parents. It's like, I don't need you to tell me I'm going to, I'm a parent. Give me something. I'll cut it up and make something. So I spent a whole life of making things. And, you know, I used to get beatings for cutting my mom's bra to make slingshots. You know, it's just crazy. (laughs) (laughs) I was in control of creating things. And and I don't want to, it was crazy. I mean, I did things not only to get attention, but I did things to let them know how good I was. Right. So like whatever toy I didn't have, you know, I made that shit out of paper. Like I that, did that building, you know, I was just doing this since I was a child. You know, I could create an entire building out of paper or, or I used to make cars and whatever. Just give me some scissors and some tape and some glue, whatever. Yeah. So, again, knowing who you are and dealing with that in this world. And now that we're in this world, and we're all addressing this racial injustice. Mm-hmm. Um I think the burden does not fall on the victim. It falls on the people inflicting the the actual uh, punishment, which is maybe a lack of employment. You know what I mean? Which someone may have the power to employ someone. Or in terms of this art stuff, you know, you have these art dealers running around here looking on college campuses for artists. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Whereas you guys are homegrown, right? And you're finding artists who are, genuine to their own self and then they're coming to you right in many community for many ages discovering yeah they're discovering shock box like i have and i'll tell you you know california has always been nice to me i've been out there once and it's really felt a lot warmer and people used to say funny i used to hear you have to be grounded dude you got to get grounded this term grounded out there was like flowing everywhere i went grounded (laughs) I'm like, grounded? Grounded to what? Grounded? I'm like, you guys got earthquakes. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even know why anybody even still stays out there. I'm like, there's nothing to this. Why are you still living there and there's earthquakes? And they're saying, oh, it's going to fall off into the sea. Right. Well, <laughs> there must be something to that, right? Because people still want to be there. Living on the edge, baby. Have you guys ever heard of, <laughs> yeah, have you guys ever heard of uh, the Pacific Rim theory? It's a TV uh, show, right? Yeah, so, yeah the mo- a movie too. But, well, but tell right, us, please. Right, right, right. But there's so I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher this a little bit, but you'll you'll get with me, right? So so if you go back to the cradle of civilization, which was in Africa, right, or or northern mm-hmm. Africa, and 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 humankind, and then everything from that kind of kind of started growing out from there, and it was growing yeah. to the east, and it was growing to the west, mm-hmm. and if you get to the to the part of that that is the United 
you know, the United States of America and, and the West Coast of the United States of America, that's the youngest part of America. It's, you know, it sure that, is. That's right. where we're growing. And from the East, you look at like Japan and that that entire seaboard. That's where they're growing. And I think even from like a like a plate tectonics level, right? Like Earth itself. That's like I think um, some of the Hawaiian Islands are the youngest inhabited oh. islands and stuff like that. And so that's also where a lot of the most recent cutting edge technologies and movements have begun, right? Like even in the art yeah. scene, like like wow. you had like the New You're York. You're really scene hitting on and, something. Yeah. Um, and so there's like this, like everybody came out west, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so I think there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot to that. That there's there's movement on the on the west coast of America right now, and I and then I guess that would be the east coast of of you know where Japan and China yeah. and all that are. Yeah, right. Um, well, I'm going to add to that and say, you know, I always think about east and west in terms of information, and this is my own you know, ideology and all of that about it is that, you know, I get up in the morning and I have a nice East, uh, <clears throat> not a disposition, but in architecture, they call it something. I forgot, but I used to study this stuff. But anyway, my windows face due East and I got a little bit of North. So I get, you know, this sunrise is spectacular. Like, like you probably get your sunsets, right? right? I get spectacular sunrises. Now I said, well, in terms of the information, if civilization started, you know, upside on the other side of the equator and east the sun rises then why am i waiting for nighttime to think about something i said why don't i just look to the sun and head for the sun so so ever since i discovered about information coming from the east and from the first person waking up and it travels from the first yawn to the last yawn to where you guys are at that's the way i look at it hmm. you know like, like from the first first person logs on and the farthest east place and then it goes for, from there you know so we get our information in a certain time zone and then you guys get the information but maybe that's why of, i get up so early carrie but in, yeah but in terms of you know being new i think that's why you guys have so much you know like that homeless thing and all that people going out there and wanting to be in the sun and trying to like you know survive and they yeah. do survive better out there because of the weather mm -hmm. there's something to this suffering man that's gonna that's it's gonna have to oh it's gonna it's gonna change it's already changing we just don't feel it yet like, we don't know it but i think all of this has this ability to show us what real positive living could be you know in terms mm -hmm. of connectivity and we I should like use it. this we should use this this waking up looking to the sun instead of waiting for the moon. You know what I mean? It's like if you look to the sun in the morning, you have a fresh start. If you look to the moon, it's over. Right. Right? I like that. I like that. I like it too. So I'm not looking to go to sleep every day. You know, I mean, oh, I can't wait till my day's over so I can go dream or whatever, whatever you do when you're sleeping. But I just get up saying to myself, I know I'm gonna be in this real physical pain. It never leaves me. So mm -hmm. I have to like use my mind to override my neurological system to get in gear with each and every moment, the way the earth rotates, because I no longer have any control. Yeah. This is what neuropathy happens with neuropathy. They tell you, Oh, it's out of your hands now mm -hmm. because you are now one with the universe. Just, I can't escape the universe and how the earth rotates and, and, and all that and barometric pressure and blah, blah, blah. I am. That I am the 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 um I, I, I'm part of the earth. I'm part of the universe now. I'm more spirit than I am physical now because of my body. You know what I mean? It's jacked up. So yeah, yeah you're I'm into that that spiritual electromagnetic connectivity that most people just take for granted every day. They just kind of because uh, they can. Yeah, they can. They're not feeling the the neurological. Uh, let's say if you ever play with electricity and you cut a wire and it mm -hmm. sparks fly. Yeah. yeah. Well, so most people haven't seen that. They haven't felt the sparks fly in their own body. But when your mm -hmm. wires get not severed, but pinched in my case, <laughs> you feel that and you know that. So again, it's, it's how you relate it to energy, mm -hmm. which we can talk all day about that. You know, I, this oh, is I got to have you back for another Einstein. Yeah. The land of Einstein is here. So, you know, you just get smarter <laughs> by just being in Prince. 
something. So it's like, but I understand energy <laughs> in a way, in, in a yeah. way that most human beings don't. And this has nothing to do with art and everything and how I live, and, but but it does because what I know I can't share because no one's feeling what I feel. Right. right. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard to understand if you haven't gone through it personally. Do you not to make this selfish about this podcast and the topic, but how has that affected your art? Has it affected your art? I'm, well, this is a great question because great question. It, yeah. as time goes on now, this I'm 14 years deep going on 15 years of, of suffering this neuropathy. And, you know, when it first happened, I was paralyzed from the waist down. Most people don't know that. Oh, damn. <clears throat> That's terrifying. So, for how long? For about three or four days. So I, I got oh, up wow. and walk. I always say to myself, not like this, or I like curse at God or curse at the energy. Whatever I have to do, like I got up and, you know, I, I went to physical therapy and I always have to go to therapy. I always have to work out. I always have to do something or I can't even wash a dish. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. This has been 14 years into it. So I've learned to cope with pain in a way that, again, I can't teach anybody it. But I could just say everyone's going to have their oh shit moment. And it's not what happens to you. It's what happens around you is how you survive. So oh, interesting. With folks not understanding my condition, I have, I'm self-isolating was the best thing to happen because I don't have to now explain anything <clears throat> right you know i i could i can work in my studio you know till i pass out which is what i normally do that's like part of my healing is is creating art and i'm glad one of your podcasts mentioned that about art therapy or something and you know, yeah i use that as a tool to make sure i'm not going out there spending money for one you know i i can make art without money because i have art supplies galore you know, because I took care of that again in my good good days <laughs> when I was physically fit. You know, I, I am a, I hate to say this, but I am a jacker. Uh, Meaning, <laughs> that's just part of graffiti. Again, the street art movement and all that, man. You know, you rack paint. Why would you steal? Why would you buy paint to go paint a train? Right. I right. heard that that's a big part of the a part of the deal is like you got to jack your cans. Like, or, yeah, you got to, I mean, there's no point in writing. Let's say you have a girlfriend. It all started with that. Say you have a girlfriend and you love her and you want to paint her name on the wall. You're going to go risk going to jail. You know what I mean? From buying a can and writing. Yeah. <laughs> I chose. You're screwing my yourself doubly. Yeah, she'd look at you like, you idiot, what'd you do that for? I thought you were going to buy the can to paint your bicycle. But the thing is, you have to get what you need, your tools, right? And I mm -hmm. didn't have anybody to like say, oh, I'm going to buy you some paint. You know what I mean? I really believe in you. So I'm going to get you some paint. You paint to your heart's desire. It yeah. didn't go out, work out like that. Yeah. You know? So I so I learned early, you know, it was better to take than ask, which is not a good thing for out there. People do not follow my example. But I didn't ask anymore after a while. I just started taking, you know? So I just... I call myself like I stole a career right now. <laughs> like I pretty much uh -huh. stole a career as being an artist because I took everything I needed to get to where I am today. This is your autobiography title, right? That's here. how you yeah. got to do it though sometimes. That's how you got to do it. I mean, can you say, mom, can you buy me a paint set? Cause I want to be Picasso. They'll look at you like, <laughs> you better get a training manual and go to vocational school and learn how to fix a car or something, you know, like do something like yeah. tangible. We know you're going to get a paycheck, you know. So uh, again, I don't know if um, I don't know if you could hear me at all. I keep cutting out. I think, but um, that, that was your that's your autobiography title. I stole a career, and and for uh, all those <laughs> and for all those people listening, there is something to take from this. Even if you don't steal something, I find when I was super poor and I couldn't afford materials, I just went around Los Angeles and I picked up shit off the streets. And stuff that people discarded. So mm -hmm. you can do that too. Um, yeah. You got to be resourceful as an artist. My father told me, and this is a great thing to share with everyone, is that, see, my dad worked in a uh, Reaper graphics place where it did photography. I'm talking about, uh, I've seen lithographs. I've seen, um, this is like, like two to five years old. You know, I've seen films being developed, paste up, uh, offset printing, um shit microfilm 
just highly technical photographic, reprographic stuff, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. for advertising and all that. So I came in with this super knowledge. All I needed to know was show me how to show me the money, show me right. how to make money with the skills I have. So I had to do what I had to do because I already knew how to do it. There's it the wasn't like right going there. to art school. It wasn't like going, okay, I need to go to art school to learn how to do this and that. I already came into art school with, with this knowledge. I wanted to be in advertising design mm-hmm. initially. That didn't work out because when I hit so-called community college, the professor was telling me I was leading the class because I was talking about pen spotting, you know, and developing film and <laughs> <laughs> dodging and burning and all this kind of and paste up. And, and she's like, you're leading the class. I'm like, well, if I'm leading the class, it's time to go. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's time to go. You know, I, I need a job. You know, that that's where it's at is to get a job. And that's another thing I could say. You, you, art in art is not a career. Being an artist is not a career. You know, right. it's a lifestyle. It is. So whatever, whatever lifestyle you want to live, you can add art to it, whether you're a collector or you're a buyer, seller, dealer, blah, blah, blah. Right. Or a painter. Lastly. Because you need money, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you can forget about having a family or anything like that if, in fact, you don't have money. So you got to make a choice, you know, whether you're going to be that sole single artist and or find support system, get married and, you know, try to work it out later, mm-hmm. which may not happen, right? You're but speaking to me right here, Carrie. Either way, I mean, Sam, when you, when you team up, I don't know about you, Preston, but when I was – in relationships, my art became the mistress. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Most of the time. And, well, and, and, and yeah. I spent too much time, you know, with the mistress and I got in lots of trouble. Oh, yeah. It's a constant. We were talking about recalibration earlier. It's a constant recalibration. You got to be making shit work. And for me, I know my wife wanted to have kids a long time ago and it just wasn't happening because I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready, not because I wasn't ready as a guy. I wasn't ready because I wasn't ready in my art career. Yeah. And for you always think, guys always think financial, like, you know, we always. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, women say, yeah, we're ready. We're going to have, you know, we want to do the family. And a guy's going to say, I need a million dollars. Right. Or, or so maybe a hundred thousand, you know. Well, yeah, yeah, maybe just a hundred thousand <laughs> or fifty thousand or something. I know there's going to be diapers to be paid for. I know there's oh, going to yeah. be. Oh, yeah. I, I want to be a provider. I don't want to be a freaking bum daddy. You know what I mean? Like, that's what held me back from even like getting in relationships. It's like I wanted to be a good dude. Like, Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be like the dudes I saw and you know abuse women and do all this crazy stuff just just to be with them. I was like, I want to if I want to be one, I want to take care of them. So I got to have this in order to have that. And then my whole Playboy Club experience is like that whole class, you know, the the cocktail glass and the really classy kind of lifestyle, which I don't see these days. Mm-hmm. I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's all yeah. like I think it's casual gone. Friday killed it. Right. As soon as they said you can dress down on Friday, that pretty much started dumbing down America. But <laughs> you know, and I grew up wearing like, you know, nice pants and shoes. I mean, we we're always into like elevating the self to that elegance, man. You know, that, that whole like treating people right and being right and, and, and and that kind of it seems like a Hollywood dream almost these days because people want to like dumb it down and like not pay attention and be responsible. Yeah. Right. So responsibility probably is really a nutshell of what we're really rapping about. You know, what I mean, if you be an artist, you got to be responsible for yourself and what actions you take in order yes. to be either a good artist or a bad one. Or you know, you want to be a one shot deal. You you want to be. Uh, Bansky uh, and unknown but known, which is some crazy shit to me. No mm-hmm. offense to whoever to do this, but like, I wish I could have pulled that shit off, you know? But mm-hmm. I know I couldn't, especially with my physical condition. But right. the point is for someone to claim an anonymity and still have a career, and you have African Americans out here that could barely even, like, you know, walk into a place without having a nervous breakdown, um, there's a oh, problem. Man. Definitely. Well, you first sparked me on this because I was listening to a different interview you did and it got me thinking because, you know, everybody knows Basquiat, you know, and it was almost like placating us a little bit. It was like, okay, we got Basquiat. Well, you know, you started telling me, well, there, there aren't that many African-Americans artists that you can even name. 
And I, so I started to think about it and I was like, Oh my, you're right. I was like, I was like Delaney. Maybe I couldn't. I couldn't come oh, up with a yeah, handful. Oh yeah, there's you know, you know what Buford I mean. Delaney, right? Briefly yeah. Delaney, um, Norman Lois. I was in a show with some of these big guys. Man, there's a guy in in, in Trenton, New Jersey. He's the largest collector of African American art in the world. Most people don't know. They don't know. I know him. I met him through my dad and all this. And most people in Trenton itself don't know it because he doesn't disclose it because he's mm-hmm. such a a sneaky. He's like a a stealthy business art guy who I have a few pieces in his collection, thank God, but he has the largest collection of African-American art in the world. It has not wow. even revealed it to the world yet. I, I somehow wish I can get involved in that deal at some later on point in the future, but you just got to pull that, some more Keith Haring, Patty Astor stuff. Just get, well, I, I, I know, I know where to direct the collection to. I know whose eyes, I know whose, whose, whose eyes would like to see it and all the stuff. Cause again, we're on this, this, African-American train right now. Right. So anyway, Buford Delaney, all these guys, you know, Norman Lewis, they're getting mm-hmm. a lot of um, uh, paper right now. Um, but the problem with that is, you know, these guys are 70, 80, 90, near death, we'll say. Right. Or or dead. Or dead. Mm-hmm. So uh, Frank Boland now, the guy from England, he's, he's got some, I like Frank Boland. He's the English guy. He's, got, he's hot in the news right now. You know, I mean, he's probably about 75 something like that but these artists i want to be hot at 75 yeah i want to be hot at 75 you know i wanted to be hot at 22 right yeah right yeah i want to be hot now if i if i do get hot i'm not going to say i'm if i if if something happens you know greater than what it already has unfortunately i can't go with the art you know Mm -hmm. which the virtual world now works for me quite well you know all i have to do is just look good you know behind the screen or something like max hedrum (laughs) <laughs> um, <laughs> they, they, yeah yeah but don't stutter again remember i told you about being able to enunciate like, this, dumb, <laughs> right. this this dumb beep beep on there so um the thing is uh i can do this virtually now and which is really great because physically i'm all i can't i wish i could fly out there you know you know how much I, after this i want to like go out there and like hang out with you guys you know and go well, especially my own it'll happen yeah you know, i have a beer I noticed some cool places out there. I got a cousin 20 minutes away. She may be arriving. She may nice. pop up. You may have an individual. Um, I don't know how she's going to do it, but she may come through. Well, well, well this is a good one this more is person a... than's coming to my solo show. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I know. Wait, Mike, sorry, we got to plug you a little bit too. What, where's your, when's your solo show? Well, I didn't mean to just jump in like that. Um, just jump in, man. Yeah, water's warm. Twenty third, so it's before Carrie's uh-huh. at um, Los Angeles Art Association Gallery eight two five up on La Cienega. Um, I know January twenty third. Yeah. yeah, and um, it's um, I'm I'm doing a reimagination of a show I did a couple of years ago called the Funeral Party. The name of my solo show is When the Quiet Comes. And I'm taking a lot of the characters that revealed themselves in the work of the funeral party and, and just putting them in a few different scenarios and trying to figure out who they are. should be fun. I love it. I saw the original yeah. funeral party, so I can't wait to see this iteration of it. Um, Carrie, so so here's the thing. I hate to do this, but we're, we're, we're going long here. Um, Longest I, podcast ever. I want... To have you back sometime because I I didn't get to half of my questions, but well, I, knew that I actually good. like I like where we went anyway organically with this. So I think there's a lot of value and a lot of the stuff we talked about. I want to uh, end by first of all t- having you tell people where they can find you uh, online. Uh, oh, so online. yeah, or or anywhere, whatever it can be more um, abstract if you want. Well, I always this this question always pains me because I say this I'm always I've been hiding in plain sight for over I don't know how many years online the simple way to do is just there's a thing called Google and you just type my name in you know if you can spell right Carrie Maurice right (laughs) and all of these wonderful my whole life pops up right everything pops up that you need to know i mean some some personal things maybe what size underwear i wear or socks <laughs> or something like that or you know my hat size but everything else, it's all there except for my personal phone number i have an e-commerce site which i work through society six mm-hmm. uh and that is red balloon studio red balloon studio.com 
It exists, however, there's no information you can find there. I just mm-hmm. own the domain until we do do something because now I'm being requested to have a website. But if you Google me, you can find plenty. Is yes, what I'm saying. And I can, can attest to that because I just movies. researched you. You can watch me. I mean, you could have a popcorn and soda night, you know, and <laughs> just, you know, learn about Terry Maurice. He's been around Carrie, for 35 years. Terry, I'm going <laughs> to bite this. I am biting this and I'm making it mine as well. Uh, hence, <laughs> henceforth, if anybody wants to know what my website is, it's, it's www.google.com. Google. <laughs> yeah. I like it. <laughs> I like it. And by the way, by the way, check out Shockbox. Two next shows coming up. Yes. We've got Intergalactic Open to you. It'll be live on Zoom for anybody who wants to watch it. Just go to Shockbox on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Carrie's got a piece, a very cool piece in that. Uh, Intergalactic Open. Oh, oh, you, you cut, cut out, out. But it, it is. Oh, damn. Cones to bones. Cones to bones. Flavors. 31 flavors. Yes. <laughs> so we got what? The 16th? Mike, tell me the dates here. I'm, I'm, I'm losing my mind. So, so the Shockbox Intergalactic Open 2 opens on uh, January 16th at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. Anybody that's listening to this that hasn't been to one of our Zoom openings, they are uh, shockingly You're more missing entertaining. It. Yeah, they're shockingly more entertaining than you think a Zoom opening would be for an art show. Um, <laughs> it, you get to hear from a lot of artists. This show has artists from as nearby as Hermosa Beach and as far away as uh, uh, there's a South Korean artist that's sending some work. Lots of artists from the East Coast. Carrie's in the show. Um, and then Carrie's show, uh, because of, you know, like he just bombed in and decided his solo show would be the entire month of February. So <laughs> it's we're gonna, February. We're gonna, yeah, hey, yeah, give me my 28 days. I like it. I like it. Um, we I hate February. To, we are going to host the Zoom opening for Carrie's show on February 6th. Um, I don't know what time we're going to do that yet. So you'll have to catch us on Instagram to find out the time. I want to coordinate for something that works with you, Carrie, so you don't have to stay up so late if you don't want to. And, um, I, I just make it Saturday we, night, Mike. <clears throat> Saturday night, the whole night. Um, and then the gallery is able to host open hours. You know, we're in a pretty heavy quarantine situation uh, here in Los Angeles County, but with, uh, you know, we can socially distance in the gallery and we can be open by appointment. So we'll get anybody that wants to come through and see these shows in person. There will be availability for that. I love it. And I want to just end by asking Carrie one last question. One of the, one of the 50% that we didn't get to, and that is any advice to young Carrie looking back. And this can also mean young artists, but specifically any advice that you'd give in part to your younger self, yes. knowing what you know now. <clears throat> don't invest in somebody else's property you don't own. Mm. Nice. And that's only because I had created a studio space and spent $10,000. And yes, I developed and had a place to live. I didn't know that it was going to turn out that way. So again, there's double-edged happiness too. But again, uh, Buy your own property and rent or something, but don't invest in someone else's investment. Unless it's a gallery, of course. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I'm, yeah, I'm in trouble. Give <laughs> it everything you got if it's a gallery. If it's shock box, put it all in. All chips are in. <laughs> all chips are in. I love it. Well, hey, thank you so much. Uh, both you guys, Carrie, Maurice, Camo, Mike Collins, of course, otherwise known as Mike. Uh, yeah. Thanks for being on this. It was a lot of fun. And I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this. So, uh, I hope anything, so. yeah, I think so. Anything you want to leave us with Carrie, Mike? I really enjoyed this conversation. If anybody is still listening to it two or three hours in, like we have been love you for that. <laughs> yeah. I know that there's a lot of good stuff. If you are an artist that has not participated with us and you've listened to this, uh, reach out, reach out to Preston, reach out to me, reach out to the gallery, reach out to Carrie. Yeah. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, and we are always, always uh, looking to show artists, you know, in, in any of our calls. I think that we're somewhat known as, as a place to get experimental, place to be new, place to not know what you're doing. Uh, and then in the middle of all of those young artists, we have some, uh, I think we've even gone from, you know, emerging artists to some that you might 
say are having you know mid career type type experiences with our gallery. Um, yeah, come jam with us, man. Definitely be be a part of the movement. I love it. Yes, be a part of the future. That's right. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much again. And uh, Carrie, I'll be at both of your shows. Yes, sir. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Awesome. All right. Well, good luck. And uh, we'll see everybody next time. Bye. Bye Bye. This has been the Living Artist Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I just want you to know that I appreciate you being here. And I'm grateful to be in your ears. Your art and creative life on this planet is meaningful. So thank you for sharing it with me. If you like this podcast, whatever platform you're listening to it on, please subscribe and share it with your friends. You can also leave me a positive review to show your support. This helps me to reach more people with the algorithmic magic and keep the show going strong. If you want to see more of what I do and check out the art that I create, you can visit my website at www.pmsartwork.com or follow me on social media everywhere at PMS Artwork. That's it for now. See you back here next time.